The Man Who Knew Too Much by G. K. Chesterton Chapter 5 The Fad of the Fisherman A thing can sometimes be too extraordinary to be remembered. If it is clean out of the course of things, and has apparently no causes and no consequences, subsequent events do not recall it, and it remains only a subconscious thing, to be stirred by some accident long after. It drifts apart like a forgotten dream. And it was in the hour of many dreams, at daybreak and very soon after the end of dark, that such a strange sight was given to a man sculling a boat down a river in the West Country. The man was awake, indeed he considered himself rather wide awake, being the political journalist Harold March, on his way to interview various political celebrities in their country seats. But the thing he saw was so inconsequent that it might have been imaginary. It simply slipped past his mind and was lost in later and utterly different events. Nor did he even recover the memory till he had long afterward discovered the meaning. Pale mists of morning lay on the fields and the rushes along one margin of the river. Along the other side ran a wall of tawny brick almost overhanging the water. He had shipped his oars and was drifting for a moment with the stream, when he turned his head and saw that the monotony of the long brick wall was broken by a bridge, rather an elegant eighteenth-century sort of bridge with little columns of white stone turning grey. There had been floods, and the river still stood very high, with dwarfish trees waist-deep in it, and rather a narrow arc of white dawn gleamed under the curve of the bridge. As his own boat went under the dark archway, he saw another boat coming toward him, rowed by a man as solitary as himself. His posture prevented much being seen of him, but as he neared the bridge, he stood up in the boat and turned round. He was already so close to the dark entry, however, that his whole figure was black against the morning light, and March could see nothing of his face except the end of two long whiskers or moustaches that gave something sinister to the silhouette, like horns in the wrong place. Even these details March would never have noticed, but for what happened in the same instant. As the man came under the low bridge, he made a leap at it and hung with his legs dangling, letting the boat float away from under him. March had a momentary vision of two black kicking legs, then of one black kicking leg, and then of nothing except the eddying stream and the long perspective of the wall. But whenever he thought of it again, long afterwards, when he understood the story in which it figured, it always fixed in that one fantastic shape, as if those wild legs were a grotesque, graven ornament of the bridge itself in the manner of a gargoyle. At the moment he merely passed staring down the stream. He could see no flying figure on the bridge, so it must have already fled. But he was half conscious of some faint significance in the fact that among the trees round the bridgehead opposite the wall he saw a lamp-post, and, beside the lamp-post, the broad blue back of an unconscious policeman. Even before reaching the shrine of his political pilgrimage he had many other things to think of besides the odd incident of the bridge. The management of a boat by a solitary man was not always easy, even on such a solitary stream. And indeed it was only by an unforeseen accident that he was solitary. The boat had been purchased and the whole expedition planned in conjunction with a friend, who had at the last moment been forced to alter all his arrangements. Harold March was to have travelled with his friend Horn Fisher on that inland voyage to Willowwood Place, where the Prime Minister was a guest at the moment. More and more people were hearing of Harold March, for his striking political articles were opening to him the doors of larger and larger salons. But he had never met the Prime Minister yet. Scarcely anybody among the general public had ever heard of Horn Fisher. But he had known the Prime Minister all his life. For these reasons, had the two taken the projected journey together, March might have been slightly disposed to hasten it, and Fisher vaguely content to lengthen it out. For Fisher was one of those people who are born knowing the Prime Minister. The knowledge seemed to have no very exhilarant effect, and in his case bore some resemblance to being born tired. But he was distinctly annoyed to receive, just as he was doing a little light packing of fishing tackle and cigars for the journey, a telegram from Willowwood asking him to come down at once by train, as the Prime Minister had to leave that night.
Fisher knew that his friend the journalist could not possibly start till the next day, and he liked his friend the journalist, and had looked forward to a few days on the river. He did not particularly like or dislike the Prime Minister, but he intensely disliked the alternative of a few hours in the train. Nevertheless, he accepted Prime Ministers as he accepted railway trains, as part of a system which he, at least, was not the revolutionist sent on earth to destroy. So he telephoned to March, asking him, with many apologetic courses and faint downs, to take the boat down the river as arranged, that they might meet at Willowwood by the time settled. Then he went outside and hailed a taxicab to take him to the railway station. There he paused at the bookstall to add to his light luggage a number of cheap murder stories which he read with great pleasure, and without any premonition that he was about to walk into as strange a story in real life. A little before sunset he arrived, with his light suitcase in hand, before the gate of the long riverside gardens of Willowwood Place. One of the smaller seats of Sir Isaac Hook, the master of much shipping and many newspapers. He entered by the gate giving on the road at the opposite side to the river, but there was a mixed quality in all that watery landscape which perpetually reminded a traveller that the river was near. White gleams of water would shine suddenly like swords or spears in the green thickets. And even in the garden itself, divided into courts and curtained with hedges and high garden trees, there hung everywhere in the air the music of water. The first of the green courts which he entered appeared to be a somewhat neglected croquet lawn, in which was a solitary young man playing croquet against himself. Yet he was not an enthusiast for the game, or even for the garden, and his sallow but well-featured face looked rather sullen than otherwise. He was only one of those young men who cannot support the burden of consciousness unless they are doing something, and whose conceptions of doing something are limited to a game of some kind. He was dark and well-dressed in a light holiday fashion, and Fisher recognised him at once as a young man named James Bullen, called for some unknown reason Bunker. He was the nephew of Sir Isaac, but what was much more important at that moment, he was also the private secretary of the Prime Minister. Hello, Bunker, observed Horn Fisher. You're the sort of man I wanted to see. Has your chief come down yet? He's only staying for dinner, replied Bullen, with his eye on the yellow ball. He's got a great speech tomorrow at Birmingham, and he's going straight through tonight. He's motoring himself there, driving the car, I mean. It's the one thing he's really proud of. You mean you're staying here with your uncle like a good boy, replied Fisher. But what will the chief do at Birmingham without the epigrams whispered to him by his brilliant secretary? Don't you start ragging me, said the young man called Bunker. I'm only too glad not to go trailing after him. He doesn't know a thing about maps or money or hotels or anything, and I have to dance about like a courier. As for my uncle, as I'm supposed to come into the estate, it's only decent to be here sometimes. Very proper, replied the other. Well, I shall see you later on and, crossing the lawn, he passed out through a gap in the hedge. He was walking across the lawn toward the landing stage on the river, and still felt all around him, under the dome of golden evening, an old-world savour and reverberation in that river-haunted garden. The next square of turf which he crossed seemed at first sight quite deserted, till he saw in the twilight of trees in one corner of it a hammock and in the hammock a man reading a newspaper and swinging one leg over the edge of the net. Him also he hailed by name, and the man slipped to the ground and strolled forward. It seemed fated that he should feel something of the past in the accidents of that place, for the figure might well have been an early Victorian ghost revisiting the ghosts of the croquet hoops and mallets. It was the figure of an elderly man with long whiskers that looked almost fantastic and a quaint and careful cut of collar and cravat. Having been a fashionable dandy forty years ago, he had managed to preserve the dandyism while ignoring the fashions. A white top hat lay beside the morning post in the hammock behind him. This was the Duke of Westmoreland, the relic of a family really some centuries old, and the antiquity was not heraldry but history. Nobody knew better than Fisher how rare such noblemen are, in fact, and how numerous in fiction. 
but whether the duke owed the general respect he enjoyed to the genuineness of his pedigree or to the fact that he owned a vast amount of very valuable property was a point about which mr fisher's opinion might have been more interesting to discover you were looking so comfortable said fisher that i thought you must be one of the servants i am looking for somebody to take this bag of mine i haven't brought a man down as i came away in a hurry nor have i for that matter replied the duke with some pride i never do if there's one animal alive i loathe it's a valet i learned to dress myself at an early age and was supposed to do it decently i may be in my second childhood but i have not got so far as being dressed like a child the prime minister hasn't brought a valet he's brought a secretary instead observed fisher devilish inferior job didn't i hear that harker was down here he's over there on the landing stage replied the duke indifferently and resumed the study of the morning post fisher made his way beyond the last green wall of the garden on to a sort of towing path looking on the river and a wooden island opposite there indeed he saw a lean dark figure with a stoop almost like that of a vulture a posture well known in the law courts as that of sir john harker the attorney-general his face was lined with headwork for alone among the three idlers in the garden he was a man who had made his own way and round his bald brow and hollow temples clung dull red hair quite flat like plates of copper i haven't seen my host yet said horne fisher in a slightly more serious tone than he had used to the others but i suppose i shall meet him at dinner you can see him now but you can't meet him answered harker he nodded his head toward one end of the island opposite and looking steadily in the same direction the other guest could see the dome of a bald head and the top of a fishing rod both equally motionless rising out of the tall undergrowth against the background of the stream beyond the fisherman seemed to be seated against the stump of a tree and facing toward the other bank so that his face could not be seen but the shape of his head was unmistakable he doesn't like to be disturbed when he's fishing continued harker it's a sort of fad of his to eat nothing but fish and he's very proud of catching his own of course he's all for simplicity like so many of these millionaires he likes to come in saying he's worked for his daily bread like a labourer does he explain how he blows all the glass and stuffs all the upholstery asked fisher and makes all the silver forks and grows all the grapes and peaches and designs all the patterns on the carpets i've always heard he was a busy man i don't think he mentioned it answered the lawyer what is the meaning of this social satire well i'm a trifle tired said fisher of the simple life and the strenuous life as lived by our little set we're all really dependent in nearly everything and we all make a fuss about being independent in something the prime minister prides himself on doing without a chauffeur but he can't do without a factotum and jack of all trades and poor old bunker has to play the part of a universal genius which god knows he was never meant for the duke prides himself on doing without a valet but for all that he must give a lot of people an infernal lot of trouble to collect such extraordinary old clothes as he wears he must have them looked up in the british museum or excavated out of the tombs that white hat alone must require a sort of expedition fitted out to find it like the north pole and here we have old hook pretending to produce his own fish when he couldn't produce his own fish knives or fish forks to eat it with he may be simple about simple things like food but you bet he's luxurious about luxurious things especially little things i don't include you you've worked too hard to enjoy playing at work i sometimes think said harker that you conceal a horrid secret of being useful sometimes haven't you come down here to see number one before he goes to birmingham horne fisher answered in a lower voice yes and i hope to be lucky enough to catch him before dinner he's got to see sir isaac about something just afterwards hello exclaimed harker sir isaac's finished his fishing i know he prides himself on getting up at sunrise and going in at sunset the old man on the island had indeed risen to his feet facing round and showing a bush of grey beard with rather small sunken features but fierce eyebrows and keen choleric eyes 
Carefully carrying his fishing tackle, he was already making his way back to the mainland across a bridge of flat stepping stones, a little way down the shallow stream. Then he veered round, coming towards his guests and civilly saluting them. There were several fish in his basket, and he was in a good temper. Yes, he said, acknowledging Fisher's polite expression of surprise. I get up before anybody else in the house, I think. The early bird catches the worm. Unfortunately, said Harker, it is the early fish that catches the worm. But the early man catches the fish, replied the old man gruffly. But from what I hear, Sir Isaac, you are the late man too, interposed Fisher. You do with very little sleep. I never had much time for sleeping, answered Hook. And I shall have to be the late man to-night, anyhow. The Prime Minister wants to have a talk, he tells me. And all things considered, I think we'd better be dressing for dinner. Dinner passed off that evening without a word of politics, and little enough but ceremonial trifles. The Prime Minister, Lord Merivale, who was a long, slim man with curly grey hair, was gravely complimentary to his host about his success as a fisherman and the skill and patience he displayed. The conversation flowed like the shallow stream through the stepping stones. It wants patience to wait for them, no doubt, said Sir Isaac, and skill to play them, but I'm generally pretty lucky at it. Does a big fish ever break the line and get away? inquired the politician with respectful interest. Not the sort of line I use, answered Hook with satisfaction. I rather specialise in tackle, as a matter of fact. If he were strong enough to do that, he'd be strong enough to pull me into the river. A great loss to the community, said the Prime Minister, bowing. Fisher had listened to all these futilities with inward impatience, waiting for his own opportunity and when the host rose he sprang to his feet with an alertness he rarely showed. He managed to catch Lord Merivale before Sir Isaac bore him off for the final interview. He had only a few words to say, but he wanted to get them said. He said, in a low voice as he opened the door for the Premier, I've seen Montmirail. He says that unless we protest immediately on behalf of Denmark, Sweden will certainly seize the ports. Lord Merivale nodded. I'm just going to hear what Hook has to say about it, he said. I imagine, said Fisher with a faint smile, that there is very little doubt what he will say about it. Merivale did not answer, but lounged gracefully toward the library, whither his host had already preceded him. The rest drifted toward the billiard room, Fisher merely remarking to the lawyer, They won't be long, we know they're practically in agreement. Hook entirely supports the Prime Minister, assented Harker. Or the Prime Minister entirely supports Hook, said Horne Fisher, and began idly to knock the balls about on the billiard table. Horne Fisher came down next morning in a late and leisurely fashion, as was his reprehensible habit. He had evidently no appetite for catching worms. But the other guests seemed to have felt a similar indifference and they helped themselves to breakfast from the sideboard at intervals during the hours verging upon lunch. So it was not many hours later when the first sensation of that strange day came upon them. It came in the form of a young man with light hair and a candid expression, who came sculling down the river and disembarked at the landing stage. It was, in fact, no other than Mr. Harold March, whose journey had begun far away up the river in the earliest hours of that day. He arrived late in the afternoon, having stopped for tea in a large riverside town, and he had a pink evening paper sticking out of his pocket. He fell on the riverside garden like a quiet and well-behaved thunderbolt. But he was a thunderbolt without knowing it. The first exchange of salutations and introductions was commonplace enough, and consisted indeed of the inevitable repetition of excuses for the eccentric seclusion of the host. He had gone fishing again, of course, and must not be disturbed till the appointed hour, though he sat within a stone's throw of where they stood. You see, it's his only hobby, observed Harker apologetically, and, after all, it's his own house, and he's very hospitable in other ways. I'm rather afraid, said Fisher, in a lower voice, that it's becoming more of a mania than a hobby. I know how it is when a man of that age begins to collect things if it's only collecting those rotten little river fish. 
You remember Talbot's uncle with his toothpicks and poor old Buzzy and the waste of cigar ashes? Hook has done a lot of big things in his time. The great deal in the Swedish timber trade and the peace conference at Chicago. But I doubt whether he cares now for any of those big things as he cares for those little fish. Oh, come, come, protested the Attorney General. You'll make Mr. March think he's come to call on a lunatic. Believe me, Hook only does it for fun, like any other sport. Only he's of the kind that takes his fun sadly. But I bet if there were big news about timber or shipping, he would drop his fun and his fish all right. Well, I wonder, said Horn Fisher, looking sleepily at the island in the river. By the way, is there any news of anything? asked Harker of Harold Marge. I see you've got an evening paper, one of those enterprising evening papers that come out in the morning. The beginning of Lord Merivale's Birmingham speech, replied March, handing him the paper. It's only a paragraph, but it seemed to me rather good. Harker took the paper, flapped and refolded it, and looked at the stop press news. It was, as March had said, only a paragraph, but it was a paragraph that had a peculiar effect on Sir John Harker. His lowering brows lifted with a flicker, and his eyes blinked, and for a moment his leathery jaw was loosened. He looked in some odd fashion like a very old man. Then, hardening his voice and handing the paper to Fisher without a tremor, he simply said, Well, here's a chance for the bet. You've got your big news to disturb the old man's fishing. Horn Fisher was looking at the paper and over his more languid and less expressive features a change also seemed to pass. Even that little paragraph had two or three large headlines, and his eyes encountered Sensational Warning to Sweden, and We Shall Protest. What the devil, he said, and his words softened first to a whisper and then a whistle. We must tell old Hook at once, or he'll never forgive us, said Harker. He'll probably want to see number one instantly though it may be too late now. I'm going across to him at once. I bet I'll make him forget his fish, anyhow. And turning his back, he made his way hurriedly along the riverside to the causeway of flat stones. March was staring at Fisher in amazement at the effect his pink paper had produced. What does it all mean, he cried. I always supposed we should protest in defence of the Danish ports, for their sakes and our own. What is all this botheration about Sir Isaac and the rest of you? Do you think it bad news? Bad news, repeated Fisher with a sort of soft emphasis beyond expression. Is it as bad as all that? asked his friend at last. As bad as all that, repeated Fisher. Why, of course, it's as good as it can be. It's great news. It's glorious news. That's where the devil of it comes in, to knock us all silly. It's admirable. It's inestimable. It's also quite incredible. He gazed again at the grey and green colours of the island and the river, and his rather dreary eye travelled slowly round to the hedges and the lawns. I felt this garden was a sort of dream, he said, and I suppose I must be dreaming. But there is grass growing and water moving, and something impossible has happened. Even as he spoke, the dark figure with a stoop like a vulture appeared in the gap of the hedge just above him. You've won your bet, said Harker, in a harsh and almost croaking voice. The old fool cares for nothing but fishing. He cursed me and told me he would talk no politics. I thought it might be so, said Fisher modestly. What are you going to do next? I shall use the old idiot's telephone anyhow, replied the lawyer. I must find out exactly what has happened. I've got to speak for the government myself tomorrow. And he hurried away toward the house. In the silence that followed, a very bewildering silence so far as March was concerned, they saw the quaint figure of the Duke of Westmoreland with his white hat and whiskers approaching them across the garden. Fisher instantly stepped toward him with the pink paper in his hand, and with a few words pointed out the apocalyptic paragraph. The Duke, who had been walking slowly, stood quite still, and for some seconds he looked like a tailor's dummy standing and staring outside some antiquated shop. Then March heard his voice, and it was high and almost hysterical. But he must see it, he must be made to understand. It cannot have been put to him properly. Then, with a certain recovery of fullness and even pomposity in the voice, I shall go and tell him myself. 
Among the queer incidents of that afternoon, March always remembered something almost comical about the clear picture of the old gentleman in his wonderful white hat, carefully stepping from stone to stone across the river, like a figure crossing the traffic in Piccadilly. Then he disappeared behind the trees of the island, and March and Fisher turned to meet the Attorney General, who was coming out of the house with a visage of grim assurance. Everybody is saying, he said, that the Prime Minister has made the greatest speech of his life, peroration and loud and prolonged cheers. Corrupt financiers and heroic peasants, we will not desert Denmark again. Fisher nodded and turned away toward the towing path, where he saw the Duke returning with a rather dazed expression. In answer to questions, he said in a husky and confidential voice, I really think our poor friend cannot be himself. He refused to listen. He uh, suggested that I might frighten the fish. A keen ear might have detected a murmur from Mr. Fisher on the subject of a white hat, but Sir John Harker struck it more decisively. Fisher was quite right. I didn't believe it myself, but it's quite clear that the old fellow is fixed on his fishing notion by now. If the house caught fire behind him, he would hardly move till sunset. Fisher had continued his stroll toward the higher embanked ground of the towing path, and he now swept a long and searching gaze, not toward the island, but toward the distant wooded heights that were the walls of the valley. An evening sky as clear as that of the previous day was settling down all over the dim landscape, but toward the west it was now red rather than gold. There was scarcely any sound but the monotonous music of the river. Then came the sound of a half-stifled exclamation from Horn Fisher, and Harold March looked up at him in wonder. "'You spoke of bad news,' said Fisher. "'Well, there is really bad news now. I'm afraid this is a bad business.' "'What bad news do you mean?' asked his friend, conscious of something strange and sinister in his voice. "'The sun has set,' answered Fisher. He went on with the air of one conscious of having said something fatal. We must get somebody to go across whom he will really listen to. He may be mad, but there's method in his madness. There nearly always is method in madness. It's what drives men mad, being methodical. And he never goes on sitting there after sunset, with the whole place getting dark. Where's his nephew? I believe he's really fond of his nephew. Look, cried March abruptly, why he's been across already. There he is coming back. And looking up the river once more, they saw, dark against the sunset reflections, the figure of James Bullen stepping hastily and rather clumsily from stone to stone. Once he slipped on a stone with a slight splash. When he rejoined the group on the bank, his olive face was unnaturally pale. The other four men had already gathered on the same spot, and almost simultaneously were calling out to him, What does he say now? Nothing. He says nothing. Fisher looked at the young man steadily for a moment. Then he started from his immobility, and, making a motion to march to follow him, himself strode down to the river crossing. In a few moments they were on the little beaten track that ran round the wooded island to the other side of it, where the fisherman sat. Then they stood and looked at him, without a word. Sir Isaac Hook was still sitting propped up against the stump of the tree, and that for the best of reasons. A length of his own infallible fishing line was twisted and tightened, twice round his throat, then twice round the wooden prop behind him. The leading investigator ran forward and touched the fisherman's hand, and it was as cold as a fish. The sun has set, said Horn Fisher, in the same terrible tones, and he will never see it rise again. Ten minutes afterwards the five men, shaken by such a shock, were again together in the garden, looking at one another with white but watchful faces. The lawyer seemed the most alert of the group. He was articulate, if somewhat abrupt. We must leave the body as it is, and telephone for the police, he said. I think my own authority will stretch to examining the servants and the poor fellow's papers to see if there is anything that concerns them. Of course, none of you gentlemen must leave this place. Perhaps there was something in his rapid and rigorous legality that suggested the closing of a net or trap, 
Anyhow, young Bullen suddenly broke down, or perhaps blew up, for his voice was like an explosion in the silent garden. I never touched him, he cried. I swear I had nothing to do with it. Who said you had? demanded Harker with a hard eye. Why do you cry out before you're hurt? Because you all look at me like that, cried the young man angrily. Do you think I don't know you're always talking about my damned debts and expectations? Rather to March's surprise, Fisher had drawn away from this first collision, leading the Duke with him to another part of the garden. When he was out of earshot of the others, he said with a curious simplicity of manner, Westmoreland, I'm going straight to the point. Well, said the other, staring at him stolidly. You have a motive for killing him, said Fisher. The Duke continued to stare, but he seemed unable to speak. I hope you had a motive for killing him, continued Fisher mildly. You see, it's rather a curious situation. If you have a motive for murdering, you probably didn't murder. But if you hadn't any motive, why then perhaps you did. What on earth are you talking about? demanded the Duke violently. It's quite simple, said Fisher. When you went across, he was either alive or dead. If he was alive, it might be you who killed him. Or why should you have held your tongue about his death? But if he was dead, and you had a reason for killing him, you might have held your tongue for fear of being accused. Then after a silence, he added abstractedly, Cyprus is a beautiful place, I believe, romantic scenery and romantic people, very intoxicating for a young man. The Duke suddenly clenched his hands and said thickly, Well, I had a motive. Then you're all right, said Fisher, holding out his hand with an air of huge relief. I was pretty sure you wouldn't really do it. You had a fright when you saw it done, as was only natural, like a bad dream come true, wasn't it? While this curious conversation was passing, Harker had gone into the house, disregarding the demonstrations of the sulky nephew, and came back presently with a new air of animation and a sheaf of papers in his hand. I've telephoned for the police, he said, stopping to speak to Fisher, but I think I've done most of their work for them. I believe I've found out the truth. There's a paper here, he stopped, for Fisher was looking at him with a singular expression, and it was Fisher who spoke next. Are there any papers that are not there, I wonder, I mean, that are not there now? After a pause, he added, let us have the cards on the table. When you went through his papers in such a hurry, Harker, weren't you looking for something to, to make sure it shouldn't be found? Harker did not turn a red hair on his hard head, but he looked at the other out of the corners of his eyes. And, I suppose, went on Fisher smoothly, that is why you, too, told us lies about having found Hook alive. You knew there was something to show that you might have killed him, and you didn't dare tell us he was killed. But, believe me, it's much better to be honest now. Harker's haggard face suddenly lit up as if with infernal flames. Honest, he cried, it's not so damn fine of you fellows to be honest. You're all born with silver spoons in your mouths and then you swagger about with everlasting virtue because you haven't got other people's spoons in your pockets. But I was born in a Pimlico lodging house, and I had to make my spoon, and there'd be plenty to say I only spoiled a horn or an honest man. And if a struggling man staggers a bit over the line in his youth, in the lower parts of the law which are pretty dingy anyhow, there's always some old vampire to hang on to him all his life for it. Guatemala and Golcondas, wasn't it? said Fisher sympathetically. Harker suddenly shuddered. Then he said, I believe you must know everything, like God Almighty. I know too much, said Horn Fisher, and all the wrong things. The other three men were drawing nearer to them, but before they came too near, Harker said in a voice that had recovered all its firmness, Yes, I did destroy a paper, but I really did find a paper too, and I believe that it clears us all. Very well, said Fisher, in a louder and more cheerful tone, let us all have the benefit of it. On the very top of Sir Isaac's papers, explained Harker, there was a threatening letter from a man named Hugo. It threatens to kill our unfortunate friend very much in the way that he was actually killed. It is a wild letter full of taunts, you can see it for yourselves but it makes a particular point of poor Hook's habit of fishing from the island. 
Above all, the man professes to be writing from a boat, and since we alone went across to him, and he smiled in a rather ugly fashion, the crime must have been committed by a man passing in a boat. Why, dear me, cried the Duke, with something almost amounting to animation. Why, I remember the man called Hugo quite well. He was a sort of body servant and bodyguard of Sir Isaac. You see, Sir Isaac was in some fear of assault. He was, he was not very popular with several people. Hugo was discharged after some row or other. But I remember him well. He was a great big Hungarian fellow with great moustaches that stood out on each side of his face. A door opened in the darkness of Harold March's memory, or rather oblivion, and showed a shining landscape like that of a lost dream. It was rather a waterscape than a landscape, a thing of flooded meadows and low trees, and the dark archway of a bridge. And for one instant he saw again the man with moustaches like dark horns leap up onto the bridge and disappear. Good heavens, he cried, why, I met the murderer this morning. Horn Fisher and Harold March had their day on the river after all. The little group broke up when the police arrived. They declared that the coincidence of March's evidence had cleared the whole company, and clinched the case against the flying Hugo. Whether that Hungarian fugitive would ever be caught appeared to Horn Fisher to be highly doubtful. Nor can it be pretended that he displayed any very demoniac detective energy in the matter, as he leaned back in the boat cushions, smoking, and watching the swaying reeds slide past. It was a very good notion to hop up onto the bridge, he said. An empty boat means very little. He hasn't been seen to land on either bank, and he's walked off the bridge without walking onto it, so to speak. He's got twenty-four hours start, his moustaches will disappear, and then he will disappear. I think there is every hope of his escape. Hope, repeated March, and stopped sculling for an instant. Yes, hope, repeated the other. To begin with, I am not going to be exactly consumed with Corsican revenge because somebody has killed Hook. Perhaps you may guess by this time what Hook was. The damned blood-sucking blackmailer was that simple, strenuous, self-made captain of industry. He had secrets against nearly everybody. One against poor old Westmoreland about an early marriage in Cyprus that might have put the Duchess in a queer position, and one against Harker about some flutter with his client's money when he was a young solicitor. That's why they went to pieces when they found him murdered, of course. They felt as if they'd done it in a dream. But I admit I have another reason for not wanting our Hungarian friend actually hanged for the murder. And what is that? asked his friend. Only that he didn't commit the murder, answered Fisher. Harold March laid down the oars and let the boat drift for a moment. Do you know, I was half expecting something like that, he said. It was quite irrational, but it was hanging about in the atmosphere like thunder in the air. On the contrary, it's finding Hugo guilty that's irrational, replied Fisher. Don't you see that they're condemning him for the very reason for which they acquit everybody else? Harker and Westmoreland were silent because they found him murdered, and knew there were papers that made them look like the murderers. Well, so did Hugo find him murdered, and so did Hugo know there was a paper that would make him look like the murderer. He had written it himself the day before. But in that case, said March, frowning, at what sort of unearthly hour in the morning was the murder really committed? It was barely daylight when I met him at the bridge, and that's some way above the island. The answer is very simple, replied Fisher. The crime was not committed in the morning. The crime was not committed on the island. March stared at the shining water without replying, but Fisher resumed like one who has been asked a question. Every intelligent murder involves taking advantage of some one uncommon feature in a common situation. A feature here was the fancy of old Hook for being the first man up every morning, his fixed routine as an angler, and his annoyance at being disturbed. The murderer strangled him in his own house after dinner on the night before, carried his corpse with all his fishing tackle across the stream in the dead of night, tied him to the tree, and left him there under the stars. It was a dead man who sat fishing there all day. Then the murderer went back to the house, or rather to the garage, and went off in his motor car. The murderer drove his own motor car. Fisher glanced at his friend's face and went on. 
you look horrified and the thing is horrible but other things are horrible too if some obscure man had been hagridden by a blackmailer and had his family life ruined you wouldn't think the murder of his persecutor the most inexcusable of murders is it any worse when a whole great nation is set free as well as a family by this warning to sweden we shall probably prevent war and not precipitate it and save many thousand lives rather more valuable than the life of that viper oh i'm not talking sophistry or seriously justifying the thing but the slavery that held him and his country was a thousand times less justifiable if i'd really been sharp i should have guessed it from his smooth deadly smiling at dinner that night do you remember that silly talk about how old isaac could always play his fish in a pretty hellish sense he was a fisher of men harold march took the oars and began to row again i remember he said and about how a big fish might break the line and get away End of chapter Chapter six The Hole in the Wall Two men, the one an architect and the other an archaeologist, met on the steps of the great house at Priors Park, and their host, Lord Bulmer, in his breezy way, thought it natural to introduce them. It must be confessed that he was hazy as well as breezy, and had no very clear connection in his mind beyond the sense that an architect and an archaeologist begin with the same series of letters. The world must remain in a reverent doubt as to whether he would, on the same principles, have presented a diplomatist to a dipsomaniac or a ratiocinator to a rat-catcher. He was a big, fair, bull-necked young man, abounding in outward gestures, unconsciously flapping his gloves and flourishing his stick. "'You two ought to have something to talk about,' he said cheerfully, "'old buildings and all that sort of thing. This is rather an old building, by the way, though I say it who shouldn't. I must ask you to excuse me a moment. I've got to go and see about the cards for this Christmas romp my sister's arranging. We hope to see you all there, of course. Juliet wants it to be a fancy dress affair, abbots and crusaders and all that. My ancestors, I suppose, after all. I trust the abbot was not an ancestor, said the archaeological gentleman with a smile. Only a sort of great uncle, I imagine, answered the other, laughing. Then his rather rambling eye rolled round the ordered landscape in front of the house. An artificial sheet of water ornamented with an antiquated nymph in the centre and surrounded by a park of tall trees, now grey and black and frosty, for it was in the depth of a severe winter. "'It's getting jolly cold,' his lordship continued. "'My sister hopes we shall have some skating as well as dancing.' "'If the crusaders come in full armour, said the other, "'you must be careful not to drown your ancestors.' "'Oh, there's no fear of that,' answered Bulmer. "'This precious lake of ours is not two feet deep anywhere.' and with one of his flourishing gestures he stuck his stick into the water to demonstrate its shallowness. They could see the short end bent in the water so that he seemed for a moment to lean his large weight on a breaking staff. The worst you can expect is to see an abbot sit down rather suddenly, he added, turning away. Well, au revoir, I'll let you know about it later. The archaeologist and the architect were left on the great stone steps smiling at each other but whatever their common interests they presented a considerable personal contrast and the fanciful might even have found some contradiction in each considered individually the former a mr james haddo came from a drowsy den in the inns of court full of leather and parchment for the law was his profession and history only his hobby he was indeed among other things the solicitor and agent of the prior's park estate but he himself was far from drowsy, and seemed remarkably wide awake, with shrewd and prominent blue eyes, and red hair brushed as neatly as his very neat costume. The latter, whose name was Leonard Crane, came straight from a crude and almost cockney office of builders and house agents in the neighbouring suburb, sunning itself at the end of a new row of jerry-built houses, with plans in very bright colours and notices in very large letters. But a serious observer, at a second glance, might have seen in his eyes something of that shining sleep that is called vision. 
and his yellow hair, while not affectedly long, was unaffectedly untidy. It was a manifest, if melancholy, truth that the architect was an artist. But the artistic temperament was far from explaining him. There was something else about him that was not definable, but which some even felt to be dangerous. Despite his dreaminess, he would sometimes surprise his friends with arts and even sports apart from his ordinary life, like memories of some previous existence. On this occasion, nevertheless, he hastened to disclaim any authority on the other man's hobby. I mustn't appear on false pretenses, he said with a smile. I hardly even know what an archaeologist is, except that a rather rusty remnant of Greek suggested that he is a man who studies old things. Yes, replied Haddo grimly, an archaeologist is a man who studies old things and finds they are new. Crane looked at him steadily for a moment and then smiled again. Dare one suggest, he said, that some of the things we have been talking about are among the old things that turn out not to be old? His companion also was silent for a moment, and the smile on his rugged face was fainter as he replied quietly, The wall round the park is really old. The one gate in it is Gothic, and I cannot find any trace of destruction or restoration. But the house and the estate generally, well, the romantic ideas read into these things are often rather recent romances, things almost like fashionable novels. For instance, the very name of this place, Prior's Park, makes everybody think of it as a moonlit medieval abbey. I dare say the spiritualists by this time have discovered the ghost of a monk there, but according to the only authoritative study of the matter I can find, the place was simply called Priors, as any rural place is called Podgers. It was the house of a Mr. Prior, a farmhouse, probably, that stood here at some time or other, and was a local landmark. Oh, there are a great many examples of the same thing, here and everywhere else. This suburb of ours used to be a village, and because some of the people slurred the name and pronounced it Hollywell, many a minor poet indulged in fancies about a holy well with spells and fairies and all the rest of it, filling the suburban drawing-rooms with Celtic twilight. Whereas anyone acquainted with the facts knows that Hollinwall simply means the hole in the wall, and probably referred to some quite trivial accident. That's what I mean when I say that we don't so much find old things as we find new ones. Crane seemed to have grown somewhat inattentive to the little lecture on antiquities and novelties, and the cause of his restlessness was soon apparent, and indeed approaching. Lord Bulmer's sister, Juliet Bray, was coming slowly across the lawn, accompanied by one gentleman and followed by two others. The young architect was in the illogical condition of mind in which he preferred three to one. The man walking with the lady was no other than the eminent Prince Borodino, who was at least as famous as a distinguished diplomatist ought to be in the interests of what is called secret diplomacy. He had been paying a round of visits at various English country houses, and exactly what he was doing for diplomacy at Prior's Park was as much a secret as any diplomatist could desire. The obvious thing to say of his appearance was that he would have been extremely handsome if he had not been entirely bald. But, indeed, that would itself be a rather bald way of putting it. Fantastic as it sounds, it would fit the case better to say that people would have been surprised to see hair growing on him, as surprised as if they had found hair growing on the bust of a Roman emperor. His tall figure was buttoned up in a tight-waisted fashion that rather accentuated his potential bulk, and he wore a red flower in his buttonhole. Of the two men walking behind, one was also bald, but in a more partial and also a more premature fashion for his drooping moustache was still yellow, and if his eyes were somewhat heavy, it was with languor and not with age. It was Horn Fisher, and he was talking as easily and idly about everything as he always did. His companion was a more striking and even more sinister figure, and he had the added importance of being Lord Bulmer's oldest and most intimate friend. He was generally known with a severe simplicity as Mr. Brain. 
but it was understood that he had been a judge and police official in India, and that he had enemies who had represented his measures against crime as themselves almost criminal. He was a brown skeleton of a man, with dark, deep, sunken eyes, and a black moustache that hid the meaning of his mouth. Though he had the look of one wasted by some tropical disease, his movements were much more alert than those of his lounging companion. It's all settled, announced the lady with great animation when they came within hailing distance. You've all got to put on masquerade things, and very likely skates as well. Though the prince says that they don't go with it, but we don't care about that. It's freezing already, and we don't often get such a chance in England. Even in India we don't exactly skate all the year round, observed Mr. Brain. And even Italy is not primarily associated with ice, said the Italian. Italy is primarily associated with ices, remarked Mr. Horn Fisher. I mean with ice cream men. Most people in this country imagine that Italy is entirely populated with ice cream men and organ grinders. There certainly are a lot of them. Perhaps they are an invading army in disguise. How do you know they are not the secret emissaries of our diplomacy? asked the prince, with a slightly scornful smile. An army of organ grinders might pick up hints, and their monkeys might pick up all sorts of things. The organs are an organised fact, said the flippant Mr. Fisher. Well, I've known it pretty cold before now in Italy, and even in India, up on the Himalayan slopes. The ice on our own little round pond will be quite cosy by comparison. Juliet Bray was an attractive lady, with dark hair and eyebrows and dancing eyes, and there was a geniality and even generosity in her rather imperious ways. In most matters she could command her brother, though that nobleman, like many other men of vague ideas, was not without a touch of the bully when he was at bay. She could certainly command her guests, even to the extent of decking out the most respectable and reluctant of them with her medieval masquerade and it really seemed as if she could command the elements also, like a witch, for the weather steadily hardened and sharpened. That night the ice of the lake, glimmering in the moonlight, was like a marble floor, and they had begun to dance and skate on it before it was dark. Priors Park, or more properly the surrounding district of Hollinwall, was a country seat that had become a suburb. Having once had only a dependent village at its doors, it now found outside all its doors the signals of the expansion of London. Mr. Haddo, who was engaged in historical researches, both in the library and the locality, could find little assistance in the latter. He had already realised from the documents that Priors Park had originally been something like Priors Farm, named after some local figure but the new social conditions were all against his tracing the story by its traditions. Had any of the real rustics remained, he would probably have found some lingering legend of Mr. Pryor, however remote he might be. But the new nomadic population of clerks and artisans, constantly shifting their homes from one suburb to another, or their children from one school to another, could have no corporate continuity. They had all the forgetfulness of history that goes everywhere with the extension of education. Nevertheless, when he came out of the library next morning and saw the wintry trees standing round the frozen pond like a black forest, he felt he might well have been far in the depths of the country. The old wall running round the park kept that enclosure itself still entirely rural and romantic, and one could easily imagine that the depths of that dark forest faded away indefinitely into distant vales and hills. The grey and black and silver of the wintry wood were all the more severe or sombre as a contrast to the coloured carnival groups that already stood on and around the frozen pool, for the house party had already flung themselves impatiently into fancy dress, and the lawyer, with his neat black suit and red hair, was the only modern figure among them. Aren't you going to dress up? asked Juliet, indignantly shaking at him a horned and towering blue headdress of the fourteenth century, which framed her face very becomingly, fantastic as it was. Everybody here has to be in the Middle Ages. Even Mr. Brain has put on a sort of brown dressing gown and says he's a monk. And Mr. Fisher got hold of some old potato sacks in the kitchen and sewed them together, 
He's supposed to be a monk, too. As to the prince, he's perfectly glorious, in great crimson robes, as a cardinal. He looks as if he could poison everybody. You simply must be something. I will be something later in the day, he replied. At present I am nothing but an antiquary and an attorney. I have to see your brother presently about some legal business, and also some local investigations he asked me to make. I must look a little like a steward when I give an account of my stewardship. Oh, but my brother has dressed up, cried the girl, very much so. No end, if I may say so. Why, he's bearing down on you now in all his glory. The noble lord was indeed marching toward them in a magnificent sixteenth-century costume of purple and gold, with a gold-hilted sword and a bloomed cap, and manners to match. Indeed, there was something more than his usual expansiveness of bodily action in his appearance at that moment. It almost seemed, so to speak, that the plumes of his hat had gone to his head. He flapped his great gold-lined cloak like the wings of a fairy king in a pantomime. He even drew his sword with a flourish and waved it about as he did his walking-stick. In the light of after events there seemed to be something monstrous and ominous about that exuberance, something of the spirit that is called fay. At the time, it merely crossed a few people's minds that he might possibly be drunk. As he strode towards his sister, the first figure he passed was that of Leonard Crane, clad in Lincoln Green, with the horn and baldric and sword appropriate to Robin Hood. For he was standing nearest to the lady, where, indeed, he might have been found during a disproportionate part of the time. He had displayed one of his buried talents in the matter of skating, and now that the skating was over, seemed disposed to prolong the partnership. The boisterous Bulmer playfully made a pass at him with his drawn sword, going forward with the lunge in the proper fencing fashion, and making a somewhat too familiar Shakespearean quotation about a rodent and a Venetian coin. Probably in Crane also there was a subdued excitement just then. Anyhow, in one flash he had drawn his sword and parried, and then, suddenly, to the surprise of everyone, Bulmer's weapon seemed to spring out of his hand into the air and rolled away on the ringing ice. "'Well, I never,' said the lady, as if with justifiable indignation. "'You never told me you could fence, too.' Bulmer put up his sword with an air rather bewildered than annoyed, which increased the impression of something irresponsible in his mood at the moment. Then he turned rather abruptly to his lawyer, saying, "'We can settle up about the estate after dinner.' I've missed nearly all the skating as it is, and I doubt if the ice will hold till tomorrow night. I think I shall get up early and have a spin by myself. You won't be disturbed with my company, said Horn Fisher, in his weary fashion. If I have to begin the day with ice, in the American fashion, I prefer it in smaller quantities. But no early hours for me in December. The early bird catches the cold. Oh, I shan't die of catching cold, answered Bulmer, and laughed. A considerable group of the skating party had consisted of the guests staying at the house, and the rest had tailed off in twos and threes some time before most of the guests began to retire for the night. Neighbours, always invited to Priors Park on such occasions, went back to their own houses in motors or on foot. The legal and archaeological gentleman had returned to the Inns of Court by a late train to get a paper called for during his consultation with his client. And most of the other guests were drifting and lingering at various stages on their way up to bed. Horn Fisher, as if to deprive himself of any excuse for his refusal of early rising, had been the first to retire to his room. But, sleepy as he looked, he couldn't sleep. He had picked up from a table the book of antiquarian topography, in which Haddo had found his first hints about the origin of the local name, and, being a man with a quiet and quaint capacity for being interested in anything, he began to read it steadily, making notes now and then of details on which his previous reading left him with a certain doubt about his present conclusions. His room was the one nearest to the lake in the centre of the woods and was therefore the quietest, and none of the last echoes of the evening's festivity could reach him. He had followed carefully the argument which established the derivation from Mr. Pryor's farm and the hole in the wall, and disposed of any fashionable fancy about monks and magic wells. 
when he began to be conscious of a noise audible in the frozen silence of the night. It was not a particularly loud noise, but it seemed to consist of a series of thuds or heavy blows, such as might be struck on a wooden door by a man seeking to enter. They were followed by something like a faint creak or crack, as if the obstacle had either been opened or had given way. He opened his own bedroom door and listened, but as he heard talk and laughter all over the lower floors, he had no reason to fear that a summons would be neglected or the house left without protection. He went to his open window, looking out over the frozen pond and the moonlit statue in the middle of their circle of darkling woods, and listened again. But silence had returned to that silent place, and after straining his ears for a considerable time, he could hear nothing but the solitary hoot of a distant departing train. Then he reminded himself how many nameless noises can be heard by the wakeful during the most ordinary night, and, shrugging his shoulders, went wearily to bed. He awoke suddenly and sat up in bed with his ears filled as with thunder, with the throbbing echoes of a rending cry. He remained rigid for a moment and then sprang out of bed, throwing on the loose gown of sacking he had worn all day. He went first to the window, which was open, but covered with a thick curtain, so that his room was still completely dark. But when he tossed the curtain aside and put his head out, he saw that a grey and silver daybreak had already appeared behind the black woods that surrounded the little lake, and that was all that he did see. Though the sound had certainly come in through the open window from this direction, the whole scene was still and empty under the morning light as under the moonlight. Then the long, rather lackadaisical hand he had laid on a window sill gripped it tighter, as if to master a tremor, and his peering blue eyes grew bleak with fear. It may seem that his emotion was exaggerated and needless, considering the effort of common sense by which he had conquered his nervousness about the noise on the previous night, but that had been a very different sort of noise. It might have been made by half a hundred things, from the chopping of wood to the breaking of bottles. There was only one thing in nature from which could come the sound that echoed through the dark house at daybreak. It was the awful articulate voice of man, and it was something worse, for he knew what man. He knew also that it had been a shout for help. It seemed to him that he had heard the very word. But the word, short as it was, had been swallowed up, as if the man had been stifled or snatched away, even as he spoke. Only the mocking reverberations of it remained even in his memory. But he had no doubt of the original voice. He had no doubt that the great bull's voice of Francis Bray, Baron Bulmer, had been heard for the last time, between the darkness and the lifting dawn. How long he stood there he never knew but he was startled into life by the first living thing that he saw stirring in that half-frozen landscape. Along the path beside the lake, and immediately under his window, a figure was walking slowly and softly, but with great composure. A stately figure in robes of a splendid scarlet. It was the Italian prince, still in his cardinal's costume. Most of the company had indeed lived in their costumes for the last day or two, and Fisher himself had assumed his frock of sacking as a convenient dressing-gown. But there seemed, nevertheless, something unusually finished and formal in the way of an early bird about this magnificent red cockatoo. It was as if the early bird had been up all night. "'What's the matter?' he called sharply, leaning out of the window, and the Italian turned up his great yellow face like a mask of brass. We had better discuss it downstairs, said Prince Borodino. Fisher ran downstairs and encountered the great red-robed figure entering the doorway and blocking the entrance with his bulk. Did you hear that cry? demanded Fisher. I heard a noise and I came out, answered the diplomatist, and his face was too dark in the shadow for its expression to be read. It was Bulmer's voice, insisted Fisher. I'll swear it was Bulmer's voice. Did you know him well? asked the other. The question seemed irrelevant, though it was not illogical, and Fisher could only answer in a random fashion that he knew Lord Bulmer only slightly. 
"'Nobody seems to have known him well,' continued the Italian, in level tones. "'Nobody except that man Brain. "'Brain is rather older than Bulmer, but I fancy they shared a good many secrets.' Fisher moved abruptly, as if waking from a momentary trance, and said in a new and more vigorous voice, "'But look here. Hadn't we better get outside and see if anything has happened?' "'The ice seems to be thawing,' said the other, almost with indifference. When they emerged from the house, dark stains and stars in the grey field of ice did indeed indicate that the frost was breaking up, as their host had prophesied the day before and the very memory of yesterday brought back the mystery of today. He knew there would be a thaw, observed the prince. He went out skating quite early on purpose. Did he call out because he landed in the water, do you think? Fisher looked puzzled. Bulmer was the last man to bellow like that because he got his boots wet. And that's all he could do here. The water would hardly come up to the calf of a man of his size. You can see the flat weeds on the floor of the lake, as if it were through a thin pane of glass. No, if Bulmer had only broken the ice, he wouldn't have said much at the moment, though possibly a good deal afterwards. We should have found him stamping and damming up and down this path, and calling for clean boots. Let us hope we shall find him as happily employed, remarked the diplomatist. In that case, the voice must have come out of the wood. I'll swear it didn't come out of the house, said Fisher and the two disappeared together into the twilight of wintry trees. The plantation stood dark against the fiery colours of sunrise, a black fringe having that feathery appearance which makes trees, when they are bare, the very reverse of rugged. Hours and hours afterwards, when the same dense but delicate margin was dark against the greenish colours opposite the sunset, the search thus begun at sunrise had not come to an end. By successive stages, and to slowly gathering groups of the company, it became apparent that the most extraordinary of all gaps had appeared in the party. The guests could find no trace of their host anywhere. The servants reported that his bed had been slept in, and his skates and his fancy costume were gone, as if he had risen early for the purpose he had himself avowed. But from the top of the house to the bottom, from the walls round the park to the pond in the centre, there was no trace of Lord Bulmer dead or alive. Horn Fisher realised that a chilling premonition had already prevented him from expecting to find the man alive. But his bald brow was wrinkled over an entirely new and unnatural problem, in not finding the man at all. He considered the possibility of Bulmer having gone off of his own accord, for some reason, but after fully weighing it, he finally dismissed it. It was inconsistent with the unmistakable voice heard at daybreak, and with many other practical obstacles. There was only one gateway in the ancient and lofty wall round the small park. The lodgekeeper kept it locked till late in the morning, and the lodgekeeper had seen no one pass. Fisher was fairly sure that he had before him a mathematical problem in an enclosed space. His instinct had been from the first so attuned to the tragedy that it would have been almost a relief to him to find the corpse. He would have been grieved, but not horrified, to come on the nobleman's body dangling from one of his own trees as from a gibbet, or floating in his own pool like a pallid weed. What horrified him was to find nothing. He soon became conscious that he was not alone, even in his most individual and isolated experiments. He often found a figure following him like his shadow, in silent and almost secret clearings in the plantation, or outlying nooks and corners of the old wall. The dark moustached mouth was as mute as the deep eyes were mobile, darting incessantly hither and thither, but it was clear that brain of the Indian police had taken up the trail like an old hunter after a tiger. Seeing that he was the only personal friend of the vanished man, this seemed natural enough, and Fisher resolved to deal frankly with him. This silence is rather a social strain, he said. May I break the ice by talking about the weather? Which, by the way, has already broken the ice. I know that breaking the ice might be a rather melancholy metaphor in this case. I don't think so, replied Brain shortly. I don't fancy the ice had much to do with it. I don't see how it could. What would you propose doing? asked Fisher. Well, we've sent for the authorities, of course. 
but i hope to find something out before they come replied the anglo-indian i can't say i have much hope from police methods in this country too much red tape habeas corpus and that sort of thing what we want is to see that nobody bolts the nearest we could get to it would be to collect the company and count them so to speak nobody's left lately except that lawyer who was poking about for antiquities oh he's out of it he left last night answered the other eight hours after bulmer's chauffeur saw his lawyer off by the train i heard bulmer's own voice as plain as i hear yours now i suppose you don't believe in spirits said the man from india after a pause he added there's somebody else i should like to find before we go after a fellow with an alibi in the inner temple what's become of that fellow in green the architect dressed up as a forester i haven't seen him about mr brain managed to secure his assembly of all the distracted company before the arrival of the police but when he first began to comment once more on the young architect's delay in putting in an appearance he found himself in the presence of a minor mystery and a psychological development of an entirely unexpected kind Juliet Bray had confronted the catastrophe of her brother's disappearance with a sombre stoicism, in which there was, perhaps, more paralysis than pain. But when the other question came to the surface, she was both agitated and angry. We don't want to jump to any conclusions about anybody, Brain was saying in his staccato style. But we should like to know a little more about Mr. Crane. Nobody seems to know much about him or where he comes from and it seems a sort of coincidence that yesterday he actually crossed swords with poor Bulmer, and could have struck him too, since he showed himself the better swordsman. Of course, that may be an accident, and couldn't possibly be called a case against anybody, but then we haven't the means to make a real case against anybody. Till the police come, we are only a pack of very amateur sleuth-hounds. And I think you're a pack of snobs, said Juliet. Because Mr. Crane is a genius who's made his own way, you try to suggest he's a murderer without daring to say so. Because he wore a toy sword and happened to know how to use it, you want us to believe he used it like a bloodthirsty maniac for no reason in the world. And because he could have hit my brother and didn't, you deduce that he did. That's the sort of way you argue. And as for his having disappeared, you're wrong in that as you are in everything else, for here he comes and indeed the green figure of the fictitious robin hood slowly detached itself from the grey background of the trees and came toward them as she spoke he approached the group slowly but with composure but he was decidedly pale and the eyes of brain and fisher had already taken in one detail of the green-clad figure more clearly than all the rest the horn still swung from his baldric but the sword was gone rather to the surprise of the company brain did not follow up the question thus suggested but while retaining an air of leading the inquiry had also an appearance of changing the subject now we're all assembled he observed quietly there is a question i want to ask to begin with did anybody here actually see lord bulmer this morning leonard crane turned his pale face round the circle of faces till he came to juliet's then he compressed his lips a little and said yes i saw him was he alive and well asked brain quickly how was he dressed he appeared exceedingly well replied crane with a curious intonation he was dressed as he was yesterday in that purple costume copied from the portrait of his ancestor in the sixteenth century he had his skates in his hand and his sword at his side i suppose asked the questioner where is your own sword mr crane i threw it away in the singular silence that ensued the train of thoughts in many minds became involuntarily a series of coloured pictures they had grown used to their fanciful garments looking more gay and gorgeous against the dark grey and streaky silver of the forest so that the moving figures glowed like stained glass saints walking the effect had been more fitting because so many of them had idly parodied pontifical or monastic dress but the most arresting attitude that remained in their memories had been anything but merely monastic that of the moment when the figure in bright green and the other in vivid violet had for a moment made a silver cross of their crossing swords 
even when it was a jest it had been something of a drama and it was a strange and sinister thought that in the grey daybreak the same figures in the same posture might have been repeated as a tragedy did you quarrel with him asked brain suddenly yes replied the immovable man in green or he quarrelled with me why did he quarrel with you asked the investigator and leonard crane made no reply Horne fisher curiously enough had only given half his attention to this crucial cross-examination his heavy lidded eyes had languidly followed the figure of prince borodino who at this stage had strolled away towards the fringe of the wood and after a pause as of meditation had disappeared into the darkness of the trees he was recalled from his irrelevance by the voice of juliet bray which rang out with an altogether new note of decision if that is the difficulty it had best be cleared up i am engaged to mr crane and when we told my brother he did not approve of it that's all neither brain nor fisher exhibited any surprise but the former added quietly except i suppose that he and your brother went off into the wood to discuss it where mr crane mislaid his sword not to mention his companion and may i ask inquired crane with a certain flicker of mockery passing over his pallid features what i am supposed to have done with either of them let us adopt the cheerful thesis that i am a murderer it has yet to be shown that i am a magician if i ran your unfortunate friend through the body what did i do with the body did i have it carried away by seven flying dragons or was it merely a trifling matter of turning it into a milk-white hind it is no occasion for sneering said the anglo-indian judge with abrupt authority it doesn't make it look better for you that you can joke about the loss fisher's dreamy and even dreary eye was still on the edge of the wood behind and he became conscious of masses of dark red like a stormy sunset cloud glowing through the dark grey network of the thin trees and the prince in his cardinal's robes re-emerged onto the pathway brain had had half a notion that the prince might have gone to look for the lost rapier but when he reappeared he was carrying in his hand not a sword but an axe the incongruity between the masquerade and the mystery had created a curious psychological atmosphere at first they had all felt horribly ashamed at being caught in the foolish disguises of a festival by an event that had only too much the character of a funeral many of them would have already gone back and dressed in clothes that were more funereal or at least more formal but somehow at the moment this seemed like a second masquerade more artificial and frivolous than the first and as they reconciled themselves to their ridiculous trappings a curious sensation had come over some of them notably over the more sensitive like crane and fisher and juliet but in some degree over everybody except the practical mr brain it was almost as if they were the ghosts of their own ancestors haunting that dark wood and dismal lake and playing some old part that they only half remembered the movements of those coloured figures seemed to mean something that had been settled long before like a silent heraldry acts attitudes external objects were accepted as an allegory even without the key and they knew when a crisis had come when they did not know what it was and somehow they knew subconsciously that the whole tale had taken a new and terrible turn when they saw the prince stand in the gap of the gaunt trees in his robes of angry crimson and with his lowering face of bronze bearing in his hand a new shape of death they could not have named a reason but the two swords seemed indeed to have become toy swords and the whole tale of them broken and tossed away like a toy Borodino looked like the old-world headsman clad in terrible red and carrying the axe for the execution of the criminal and the criminal was not crane mr brain of the indian police was glaring at the new object and it was a moment or two before he spoke harshly and almost hoarsely what are you doing with that he asked seems to be a woodman's chopper a natural association of ideas observed horne fisher if you meet a cat in the wood you think it's a wild cat 
though it may have just strolled from the drawing-room sofa. As a matter of fact, I happen to know that is not a woodman's chopper. It's the kitchen chopper or meat axe or something like that that somebody has thrown away in the wood. I saw it in the kitchen myself when I was getting the potato sacks with which I reconstructed a medieval hermit. All the same, it's not without interest, remarked the prince, holding out the instrument to Fisher, who took it and examined it carefully. A butcher's cleaver that has done butcher's work. It was certainly the instrument of the crime, assented Fisher in a low voice. Brain was staring at the dull blue gleam of the axe head with fierce and fascinated eyes. I don't understand you, he said. There is no, there are no marks on it. It has shed no blood, answered Fisher, but for all that it has committed a crime. This is as near as the criminal came to the crime when he committed it. What do you mean? He was not there when he did it, explained Fisher. It's a poor sort of murderer who can't murder people when he isn't there. You seem to be talking merely for the sake of mystification, said Brain. If you have any practical advice to give, you might as well make it intelligible. The only practical advice I can suggest, said Fisher thoughtfully, is a little research into local topography and nomenclature. They say there used to be a Mr. Pryor who had a farm in this neighbourhood. I think some details about the domestic life of the late Mr. Pryor would throw a light on this terrible business. And you have nothing more immediate than your topography to offer, said Brain with a sneer, to help me avenge my friend. Well, said Fisher, I should find out the truth about the hole in the wall. That night, at the close of a stormy twilight and under a strong west wind that followed the breaking of the frost, Lend Crane was wending his way in a wild, rotary walk round and round the high, continuous wall that enclosed the little wood. He was driven by a desperate idea of solving for himself the riddle that had clouded his reputation, and already even threatened his liberty. The police authorities, now in charge of the inquiry, had not arrested him, but he knew well enough that if he tried to move far afield, he would be instantly arrested. Horn Fisher's fragmentary hints, though he had refused to expand them as yet, had stirred the artistic temperament of the architect to a sort of wild analysis and he was resolved to read the hieroglyph upside down and every way until it made sense. If it was something connected with a hole in the wall, he would find the hole in the wall, but as a matter of fact he was unable to find the faintest crack in the wall. His professional knowledge told him that the masonry was all of one workmanship and one date, and except for the regular entrance which threw no light on the mystery, he found nothing suggesting any sort of hiding place or means of escape. Walking a narrow path between the winding wall and the wild eastward bend and sweep of the grey and feathery trees, seeing shifting gleams of a lost sunset winking almost like lightning as the clouds of tempest scudded across the sky and, mingling with the first faint blue light from a slowly strengthened moon behind him, he began to feel his head going round as his heels were going round and round the blind recurrent barrier. He had thoughts on the border of thought, fancies about a fourth dimension which was itself a hole to hide anything, of seeing everything from a new angle out of a new window in the senses, or of some mystical light and transparency, like the new rays of chemistry in which he could see Bulmer's body horrible and glaring, floating in a lurid halo over the woods and the wall. He was haunted also with the hint which somehow seemed to be equally horrifying that it all had something to do with Mr. Pryor. There seemed even to be something creepy in the fact that he was always respectfully referred to as Mr. Pryor, and that it was in the domestic life of the dead farmer that he had been bidden to seek the seed of these dreadful things. As a matter of fact, he had found that no local inquiries had revealed anything at all about the Pryor family. The moonlight had broadened and brightened, the wind had driven off the clouds and itself died fitfully away, when he came round again to the artificial lake in front of the house. For some reason it looked a very artificial lake. Indeed the whole scene was like a classical landscape with a touch of Watto. The Palladian façade of the house pale in the moon, and the same silver touching the very pagan and naked marble nymph in the middle of the pond, 
Rather to his surprise, he found another figure there beside the statue, sitting almost equally motionless, and the same silver pencil traced the wrinkled brow and patient face of Horne Fisher. Still dressed as a hermit, and apparently practising something of the solitude of a hermit. Nevertheless, he looked up at Leonard Crane and smiled, almost as if he had expected him. Look here, said Crane, planting himself in front of him. Can you tell me anything about this business? I shall soon have to tell everybody everything about it, replied Fisher, but I've no objection to telling you something first. But, to begin with, will you tell me something? What really happened when you met Bulmer this morning? You did throw away your sword, but you didn't kill him. I didn't kill him because I threw away my sword, said the other. I did it on purpose, or I'm not sure what might have happened. After a pause, he went on quietly. The late Lord Bulmer was a very breezy gentleman, extremely breezy. He was very genial with his inferiors, and would have his lawyer and his architect staying in his house for all sorts of holidays and amusements. But there was another side to him, which they found out when they tried to be his equals. When I told him that his sister and I were engaged, something happened which I simply can't and won't describe. It seemed to me like some monstrous upheaval of madness. But I suppose the truth is painfully simple. There is such a thing as the coarseness of a gentleman. And it is the most horrible thing in humanity. I know, said Fisher, the Renaissance nobles of the Tudor time were like that. It is odd that you should say that, Crane went on, for while we were talking there came on me a curious feeling that we were repeating some scene of the past and that I was really some outlaw, found in the woods like Robin Hood, and that he had really stepped in all his plumes and purple out of the picture frame of the ancestral portrait. Anyhow, he was the man in possession, and he neither feared God nor regarded man. I defied him, of course, and walked away. I might really have killed him if I had not walked away. Yes, said Fisher, nodding. His ancestor was in possession, and he was in possession and this is the end of the story. It all fits in. Fits in with what? cried his companion with sudden impatience. I can't make head or tail of it. You tell me to look for the secret in the hole in the wall, but I can't find any hole in the wall. There isn't any, said Fisher. That's the secret. After reflecting a moment, he added, unless you call it a hole in the wall of the world, look, here, I'll tell you if you like, but I'm afraid it involves an introduction. You've got to understand one of the tricks of the modern mind, a tendency that most people obey without noticing it. In the village or suburb outside there's an inn with the sign of St. George and the Dragon. Now, suppose I went about telling everybody that this was only a corruption of King George and the Dragoon. Scores of people would believe it, without any inquiry from a vague feeling that it's probable because it's prosaic. It turns something romantic and legendary into something recent and ordinary. And that somehow makes it sound rational, though it's unsupported by reason. Of course, some people would have the sense to remember having seen St. George in old Italian pictures and French romances, but a good many wouldn't think about it at all. They would just swallow the scepticism because it was scepticism. Modern intelligence won't accept anything on authority, but it will accept anything without authority. That's exactly what has happened here. When some critic or other chose to say that Prior's Park was not a priory, but was named after some quite modern man named Prior, nobody really tested the theory at all. It never occurred to anybody repeating the story to ask if there was any Mr. Prior, if anybody had ever seen him or heard of him. As a matter of fact, it was a priory, and shared the fate of most priories. That is, the Tudor gentleman with the bloom simply stole it by brute force and turned it into his own private house. He did worse things, as you shall hear. But the point here is that this is how the trick works, and the trick works in the same way in the other parts of the tale. The name of this district is printed Holinwall in all the best maps produced by the scholars, and they allude lightly, not without a smile, to the fact that it was pronounced Hollywell by the most ignorant and old-fashioned of the poor but it is spelled wrong and pronounced right. Do you mean to say, asked Crane quickly, that there really was a well, 
There is a well, said Fisher, and the truth lies at the bottom of it. As he spoke, he stretched out his hand and pointed toward the sheet of water in front of him. The well is under the water somewhere, he said, and this is not the first tragedy connected with it. The founder of this house did something which his fellow ruffians very seldom did, something that had to be hushed up even in the anarchy of the pillage of the monasteries. The well was connected with the miracles of some saint, and the last prior that guarded it was something like a saint himself. Certainly he was something very like a martyr. He defied the new owner and dared him to pollute the place, till the noble, in a fury, stabbed him and flung his body into the well, whither, after four hundred years, it has been followed by an heir of the usurper, clad in the same purple and walking the world with the same pride. But how did it happen, demanded Crane, that for the first time Bulmer fell in at that particular spot? Because the ice was only loosened at that particular spot by the only man who knew it, answered Horn Fisher. It was cracked deliberately with the kitchen chopper at that special place, and I myself heard the hammering and did not understand it. The place had been covered with an artificial lake, if only because the whole truth had to be covered with an artificial legend. But don't you see that it is exactly what those pagan nobles would have done, to desecrate it with a sort of heathen goddess, as the Roman emperor built a temple to Venus on the Holy Sepulchre? But the truth could still be traced out by any scholarly man determined to trace it. And this man was determined to trace it. What man? asked the other, with a shadow of the answer in his mind. The only man who has an alibi, replied Fisher. James Haddo, the antiquarian lawyer, left the night before the fatality, but he left that black star of death on the ice. He left abruptly, having previously proposed to stay, probably, I think, after an ugly scene with Bulmer at their legal interview. As you know yourself, Bulmer could make a man feel pretty murderous, and I rather fancy the lawyer had himself irregularities to confess, and was in danger of exposure by his client. But it's my reading of human nature that a man will cheat in his trade, but not in his hobby. Haddo may have been a dishonest lawyer, but he couldn't help being an honest antiquary. When he got on the track of the truth about the Holy Well, he had to follow it up. He was not to be bamboozled with newspaper anecdotes about Mr. Pryor and a hole in the wall. He found out everything, even to the exact location of the well. And he was rewarded if being a successful assassin can be regarded as a reward. And how did you get on the track of all this hidden history? asked the young architect. A cloud came across the brow of Horn Fisher. I knew only too much about it already, he said. And after all, it's shameful for me to be speaking lightly of Paul Bulmer, who has paid his penalty. But the rest of us haven't. I dare say every cigar I smoke and every liqueur I drink comes directly or indirectly from the harrying of the holy places and the persecution of the poor. After all, it needs very little poking about in the past to find that hole in the wall, that great breach in the defences of English history. It lies just under the surface of a thin sheet of sham information and instruction, just as the black and blood-stained well lies just under the floor of shallow water and flat weeds. Oh, the ice is thin, but it bears. It is strong enough to support us when we dress up as monks and dance on it, in mockery of the dear, quaint old Middle Ages. They told me I must put on fancy dress, so I did put on fancy dress, according to my own taste and fancy. I put on the only costume I think fit for a man who has inherited the position of a gentleman, and yet has not entirely lost the feelings of one. In answer to a look of inquiry, he rose with a sweeping and downward gesture. Sackcloth, he said, and I would wear the ashes as well, if they would stay on my bald head. End of chapter. Chapter 7. The Temple of Silence Harold March and the few who cultivated the friendship of Horn Fisher especially if they saw something of him in his own social setting, were conscious of a certain solitude in his very sociability. They seemed to be always meeting his relations and never meeting his family. 
perhaps it would be truer to say that they saw much of his family and nothing of his home his cousins and connections ramified like a labyrinth all over the governing class of great britain and he seemed to be on good or at least good-humoured terms with most of them for horne fisher was remarkable for a curious impersonal information and interest touching all sorts of topics so that one could sometimes fancy that his culture like his colourless fair moustache and pale drooping features had the neutral nature of a chameleon anyhow he could always get on with viceroys and cabinet ministers and all the great men responsible for great departments and talk to each of them on his own subject on the branch of study with which he was most seriously concerned thus he could converse with the minister for war about silkworms with the minister of education about detective stories with the minister of labour about limoges enamel and with the minister of missions and moral progress if that be his correct title about the pantomime boys of the last four decades and as the first was his first cousin the second his second cousin the third his brother-in-law and the fourth his uncle by marriage this conversational versatility certainly served in one sense to create a happy family but march never seemed to get a glimpse of that domestic interior to which men of the middle classes are accustomed in their friendships and which is indeed the foundation of friendship and love and everything else in any sane and stable society he wondered whether horne fisher was both an orphan and an only child it was therefore with something like a start that he found that fisher had a brother much more prosperous and powerful than himself though hardly march thought so entertaining sir henry harland fisher with half the alphabet after his name was something at the foreign office far more tremendous than the foreign secretary apparently it ran in the family after all for it seemed there was another brother ashton fisher in india rather more tremendous than the viceroy sir henry fisher was a heavier but handsomer addition of his brother with a brow equally bald but much more smooth he was very courteous but a shade patronizing not only to march but even as march fancied to horne fisher as well the latter gentleman who had many intuitions about the half-formed thoughts of others glanced at the topic himself as they came away from the great house in berkeley square why don't you know he observed quietly that i am the fool of the family it must be a clever family said harold march with a smile very gracefully expressed replied fisher that is the best of having a literary training well perhaps it is an exaggeration to say i am the fool of the family it is enough to say i am the failure of the family it seems queer to me that you should fail especially remarked the journalist as they say in the examinations what did you fail in politics replied his friend i stood for parliament when i was quite young and got in by an enormous majority with loud cheers and cheering round the town since then of course i've been rather under a cloud i'm afraid i don't quite understand the of course answered march laughing that part of it isn't worth understanding said fisher but as a matter of fact old chap the other part of it was rather odd and interesting quite a detective story in its way as well as the first lesson i had in what modern politics are made of if you like i'll tell you about it and the following recast in a less elusive and conversational manner is the story that he told nobody privileged of late years to meet sir henry harland fisher would believe that he had ever been called harry but indeed he had been boyish enough when a boy and that serenity which shone on him through life and which now took the form of gravity had once taken the form of gaiety his friends would have said that he was all the more ripe in his maturity for having been young in his youth his enemies would have said that he was still light-minded but no longer light-hearted but in any case the whole of the story horne fisher had to tell arose out of the accident which had made young harry fisher private secretary to lord saltoun hence his later connection with the foreign office which had indeed come to him as a sort of legacy from his lordship when that great man was the power behind the throne 
this is not the place to say much about Saltoon, little as was known of him, and much as there was worth knowing. England has had at least three or four such secret statesmen. An aristocratic polity produces every now and then an aristocrat who is also an accident, a man of intellectual independence and insight, a Napoleon born in the purple. His vast work was mostly invisible, and very little could be got out of him in private life except a crusty and rather cynical sense of humour. But it was certainly the accident of his presence at a family dinner of the Fishers, and the unexpected opinion he expressed, which turned what might have been a dinner-table joke into a sort of small sensational novel. Save for Lord Saltoon, it was a family party of Fishers, but the only other distinguished stranger had just departed after dinner, leaving the rest to the coffee and cigars. This had been a figure of some interest, a young Cambridge man named Eric Hughes, who was the rising hope of the party of reform, to which the Fisher family, along with their friend Saltoon, had long been at least formally attached. The personality of Hughes was substantially summed up in the fact that he talked eloquently and earnestly through the whole dinner, but left immediately after to be in time for an appointment. All his actions had something at once ambitious and conscientious. He drank no wine, but was slightly intoxicated with words. And his face and phrases were on the front page of all the newspapers just then, because he was contesting the safe seat of Sir Francis Verner in the great by-election in the West. Everybody was talking about the powerful speech against squirearchy which he had just delivered. Even in the Fisher circle, everybody talked about it, except Horn Fisher himself, who sat in a corner, lowering over the fire. We jolly well have to thank him for putting some new life into the old party, Ashton Fisher was saying. This campaign against the old squires just hits the degree of democracy there is in this country. This act for extending county council control is practically his bill. So you may say he's in the government even before he's in the house. One's easier than the other, said Harry carelessly. I bet the squires are bigger pots than the county council in that county. Werner is pretty well rooted. All these rural places are what you call reactionary. Damning aristocrats won't alter it. He damns them rather well, observed Ashton. We never had a better meeting than the one in Barkington, which generally goes constitutional. And when he said, Sir Francis may boast of blue blood, let us show we have red blood, and went on to talk about manhood and liberty, the room simply rose at him. Speaks very well, said Lord Saltoon gruffly, making his only contribution to the conversation so far. Then the almost equally silent Horn Fisher suddenly spoke, without taking his brooding eyes off the fire. What I can't understand, he said, is why nobody has ever slanged for the real reason. Hello, remarked Harry humorously, you beginning to take notice? Well, take Werner, continued Horn Fisher. If we want to attack Werner, why not attack him? Why compliment him on being a romantic reactionary aristocrat? Who is Werner? Where does he come from? His name sounds old, but I never heard of it before, as the man said of the crucifixion. Why talk about his blue blood? His blood may be gamboge yellow with green spots, for all anybody knows. All we know is that the old squire, Hawker, somehow rammed through his money, and his second wife's, I suppose, for she was rich enough, and sold the estate to a man named Werner. What did he make his money in? Oil? Army contracts? I don't know, said Saltoon, looking at him thoughtfully. First thing I ever knew you didn't know, cried the exuberant Harry. And there's more besides, went on Horn Fisher, who seemed to have suddenly found his tongue. If we want country people to vote for us, why don't we get somebody with some notion about the country? We don't talk to people in Threadneedle Street about nothing but turnips and pigsties. Why do we talk to people in Somerset about nothing but slums and socialism? Why don't we give the squire's land to the squire's tenants, instead of dragging in the county council? Three acres and a cow, cried Harry, emitting what the parliamentary reports call an ironical cheer. Yes, replied his brother stubbornly. Don't you think agricultural labourers would rather have three acres and a cow than three acres of printed forms and a committee? Why doesn't somebody start a yeoman party in politics, appealing to the old traditions of the small landowner? 
and why don't they attack men like Verna for what they are, which is something about as old and traditional as an American oil trust? You had better lead the yeoman party yourself, laughed Harry. Don't you think it would be a joke, Lord Saltoon, to see my brother and his merry men with their bows and bills marching down to Somerset, all in Lincoln Green instead of Lincoln and Bennet hats? No, answered old Saltoon. I don't think it would be a joke. I think it would be an exceedingly serious and sensible idea. Well, I'm jiggered, cried Harry Fisher, staring at him. I said just now it was the first fact you didn't know, and I should say this is the first joke you didn't see. I've seen a good many things in my time, said the old man, in his rather sour fashion. I've told a good many lies in my time, too, and perhaps I've got rather sick of them. But there are lies and lies for all that. Gentlemen used to lie just as schoolboys lie, because they hung together and partly to help one another out. But I'm damned if I can see why we should lie for these cosmopolitan cads who only help themselves. They're not backing us up any more, they're simply crowding us out. If a man like your brother likes to go into Parliament as a yeoman, or a gentleman, or a Jacobite, or an ancient Briton, I should say it would be a jolly good thing. In the rather startled silence that followed, Horn Fisher sprang to his feet, and all his dreary manner dropped off him. I'm ready to do it tomorrow, he cried. I suppose none of you fellows would back me up. Then Harry Fisher showed the finer side of his impetuosity. He made a sudden movement as if to shake hands. You're a sport, he said, and I'll back you up if nobody else will. But we can all back you up, can't we? I see what Lord Saltoon means, and of course he's right. He's always right. So I will go down to Somerset, said Horne Fisher. Yes, it is on the way to Westminster, said Lord Saltoon with a smile. And so it happened that Horne Fisher arrived some days later, the little station of a rather remote market town in the west, accompanied by a light suitcase and a lively brother. It must not be supposed, however, that the brother's cheerful tone consisted entirely of chaff. He supported the new candidate with hope as well as hilarity and at the back of his boisterous partnership there was an increasing sympathy and encouragement. Harry Fisher had always had an affection for his more quiet and eccentric brother, and was now coming more and more to have a respect for him. As the campaign proceeded, the respect increased to ardent admiration, for Harry was still young, and could feel the sort of enthusiasm for his captain in electioneering that a schoolboy can feel for his captain in cricket. Nor was the admiration undeserved. As the new three-cornered contest developed, it became apparent to others besides his devoted kinsman that there was more in Horn Fisher than had ever met the eye. It was clear that his outbreak by the family fireside had been but a culmination of a long course of brooding and studying on the question. The talent he retained through life for studying his subject, and even somebody else's subject, had long been concentrated on this idea of championing a new peasantry against a new plutocracy. He spoke to a crowd with eloquence and replied to an individual with humour, two political arts that seemed to come to him naturally. He certainly knew much more about rural problems than either Hughes, the reform candidate, or Werner, the constitutional candidate. And he probed those problems with a human curiosity and went below the surface in a way that neither of them dreamed of doing. He soon became the voice of popular feelings that are never found in the popular press. New angles of criticism, arguments that had never before been uttered by an educated voice, tests and comparisons that had been made only in dialect by men drinking in the little local public houses, crafts half forgotten that had come down by a sign of hand and tongue from remote ages, when their fathers were free, all this created a curious and double excitement. It startled the well-informed by being a new and fantastic idea they had never encountered. It startled the ignorant by being an old and familiar idea they never thought to have seen revived. Men saw things in a new light, and knew not even whether it was the sunset or the dawn. Practical grievances were there to make the movement formidable. As Fisher went to and fro among the cottages and country inns, it was borne in on him without difficulty that Sir Francis Verner was a very bad landlord. Nor was the story of his acquisition of the land any more ancient and dignified 
than he had supposed. The story was well known in the county, and in most respects was obvious enough. Hawker, the old squire, had been a loose, unsatisfactory sort of person, had been on bad terms with his first wife, who died, as some said, of neglect, and had then married a flashy South American Jewess with a fortune. But he must have worked his way through this fortune, also, with marvellous rapidity, for he had been compelled to sell the estate to Werner, and had gone to live in South America, possibly, on his wife's estates. But Fisher noticed that the laxity of the old squire was far less hated than the efficiency of the new squire. Werner's history seemed to be full of smart bargains and financial flutters that left other people short of money and temper. But though he heard a great deal about Werner, there was one thing that continually eluded him. Something that nobody knew, that even Saltoon had not known. He could not find out how Werner had originally made his money. He must have kept it specially dark, said Horne Fisher to himself. It must be something he's really ashamed of. Hang it all, what is a man ashamed of nowadays? And as he pondered on the possibilities, they grew darker and more distorted in his mind. He thought vaguely of things remote and repulsive, strange forms of slavery or sorcery, and then of ugly things yet more unnatural but nearer home. The figure of Werner seemed to be blackened and transfigured in his imagination, and to stand against varied backgrounds and strange skies. As he strode up a village street, brooding thus, his eyes encountered a complete contrast in the face of his other rival, the reform candidate. Eric Hughes, with his blown blonde hair and eager undergraduate face, was just getting into his motor-car and saying a few final words to his agent, a sturdy, grizzled man named Grice. Eric Hughes waved his hand in a friendly fashion, but Grice eyed him with some hostility. Eric Hughes was a young man with genuine political enthusiasms, but he knew that political opponents are people with whom one may have to dine any day. But Mr. Grice was a grim little local radical, a champion of the chapel, and one of those happy people whose work is also their hobby. He turned his back as the motor-car drove away, and walked briskly up the sunlit high street of the little town, whistling, with political papers sticking out of his pocket. Fisher looked pensively after the resolute figure for a moment, and then, as if by an impulse, began to follow it, through the busy market-place, amid the baskets and barrows of market-day, under the painted wooden sign of the Green Dragon, up a dark side entry, under an arch, and through a tangle of crooked cobble streets, the two threaded their way the square strutting figure in front, and the lean lounging figure behind him, like his shadow in the sunshine. At length they came to a brown brick house with a brass plate, on which was Mr. Grice's name, and that individual turned and beheld his pursuer with a stare. "'Could I have a word with you, sir?' asked Horne Fisher politely. The agent stared still more, but assented civilly, and led the other into an office, littered with leaflets and hung all around with highly coloured posters which linked the name of Hughes with all the higher interests of humanity. Mr. Horn Fisher, I believe, said Mr. Grice, much honoured by the call, of course. Can't pretend to congratulate you on entering the contest, I'm afraid. You won't expect that. Here we've been keeping the old flag flying for freedom and reform, and you come in and break the battle line. For Mr. Elijah Grice abounded in military metaphors, and in denunciations of militarism. He was a square-jawed, blunt-featured man, with a pugnacious cock of the eyebrow. He had been pickled in the politics of that countryside from boyhood. He knew everybody's secrets, and electioneering was the romance of his life. "'I suppose you think I'm devoured with ambition,' said Horne Fisher, in his rather listless voice, aiming at a dictatorship and all that. "'Well, I think I can clear myself of the charge of mere selfish ambition.' I only want certain things done. I don't want to do them. I very seldom want to do anything. And I've come here to say that I'm quite willing to retire from the contest, if you can convince me that we really want to do the same thing. The agent of the Reform Party looked at him with an odd and slightly puzzled expression, and before he could reply, Fisher went on in the same level tones. You'd hardly believe it, but I keep a conscience concealed about me, and I am in doubt about several things. 
For instance, we both want to turn Werner out of Parliament, but what weapon are we to use? I've heard a lot of gossip against him, but is it right to act on mere gossip? Just as I want to be fair to you, so I want to be fair to him. If some of the things I've heard are true, he ought to be turned out of Parliament and every other club in London. But I don't want to turn him out of Parliament if they aren't true. At this point, the light of battle sprang into Mr. Grice's eyes, and he became voluble, not to say violent. He, at any rate, had no doubt that the stories were true. He could testify to his own knowledge that they were true. Werner was not only a hard landlord, but a mean landlord, a robber as well as a rack renter. Any gentleman would be justified in hounding him out. He had cheated old Wilkins out of his freehold by a trick fit for a pickpocket. He had driven old Mother Biddle to the workhouse. He had stretched the law against Long Adam the poacher till all the magistrates were ashamed of him. So if you'll serve under the old banner, concluded Mr. Grice more genially, and turn out a swindling tyrant like that, I'm sure you'll never regret it. And if that is the truth, said Horn Fisher, are you going to tell it? What do you mean, tell the truth? demanded Grice. I mean, you're going to tell the truth as you have just told it, replied Fisher. You're going to placard this town with the wickedness done to old Wilkins. You're going to fill the newspapers with the infamous story of Mrs. Biddle. You're going to denounce Werner from a public platform, naming him for what he did and naming the poacher he did it to. And you're going to find out by what trade this man made the money with which he bought the estate. And when you know the truth, as I said before, of course you're going to tell it. Upon those terms I come under the old flag, as you call it, and haul down my little pennon. The agent was eyeing him with a curious expression, surly but not entirely unsympathetic. Well, he said slowly, you have to do these things in a regular way, you know, or people don't understand. I've had a lot of experience, and I'm afraid what you say wouldn't do. People understand slanging squires in a general way, but those personalities aren't considered fair play. It looks like hitting below the belt. Old Wilkins hasn't got a belt, I suppose, replied Horn Fisher. Werner can hit him anyhow, and nobody must say a word. It is evidently very important to have a belt, but apparently you have to be rather high up in society to have one. Possibly, he added thoughtfully, possibly the explanation of the phrase a belted earl, the meaning of which has always escaped me. I mean those personalities won't do, returned Grice, frowning at the table. And Mother Biddle and Long Adam the poacher are not personalities, said Fisher, and suppose we mustn't ask how Werner made all the money that enabled him to become a personality? Grice was still looking at him under lowering brows, but the singular light in his eyes had brightened. At last he said, in another and much quieter voice, Look here, sir, I like you, if you don't mind me saying so. I think you are really on the side of the people, and I'm sure you're a brave man. A lot braver than you know, perhaps. We daren't touch what you propose with a barge pole, and so far from wanting you in the old party, we'd rather you ran your own risk by yourself. But because I like you and respect your pluck, I'll do you a good turn before we part. I don't want you to waste time barking up the wrong tree. You talk about how the new squire got the money to buy, and the ruin of the old squire and all the rest of it. Well, I'll give you a hint about that. A hint about something precious few people know. I'm very grateful, said Fisher, gravely. What is it? It's in two words, said the other. The new squire was quite poor when he bought. The old squire was quite rich when he sold. Horn Fisher looked at him thoughtfully as he turned away abruptly and busied himself with the papers on his desk. Then Fisher uttered a short phrase of thanks and farewell and went out into the street, still very thoughtful. His reflections seemed to end in resolution, and falling in a more rapid stride, he passed out of the little town, along a road leading towards the gate of the great park, the country seat of Sir Francis Werner. A glitter of sunlight made the early winter more like a late autumn, and the dark woods were touched here and there with red and golden leaves, like the last rays of a lost sunset. From a higher part of the road, he had seen the long classical façade of the great house with its many windows. Almost immediately beneath him, 
but when the road ran down under the wall of the estate topped with towering trees behind he realized that it was half a mile round to the lodge gates after walking for a few minutes along the lane however he came to a place where the wall had cracked and was in process of repair as it was there was a great gap in the grey masonry that looked at first as black as a cavern and only showed at a second glance the twilight of the twinkling trees there was something fascinating about that unexpected gate like the opening of a fairy tale horne fisher had in him something of the aristocrat which is very near to the anarchist it was characteristic of him that he turned into this dark and irregular entry as casually as into his own front door, merely thinking that it would be a short cut to the house. He made his way through the dim wood for some distance and with some difficulty, until there began to shine through the trees a level light in lines of silver, which he did not at first understand. The next moment he had come out into the daylight at the top of a steep bank, at the bottom of which a path ran round the rim of a large ornamental lake. The sheet of water which he had seen shimmering through the trees was of considerable extent, but was walled in on every side with woods which were not only dark, but decidedly dismal. At one end of the path was a classical statue of some nameless nymph, and at the other end it was flanked by two classical urns, but the marble was weather-stained and streaked with green and grey. A hundred other signs, smaller but more significant, told him that he had come on some outlying corner of the grounds, neglected and seldom visited. In the middle of the lake was what appeared to be an island, and on the island what appeared to be meant for a classical temple, not open like a temple of the winds, but with a blank wall between its Doric pillars. We may say it only seemed like an island, because a second glance revealed a low causeway of flat stones running up to it from the shore and turning it into a peninsula and certainly it only seemed like a temple for nobody knew better than horned fisher that no god had ever dwelt in that shrine that's what makes all this classical landscape gardening so desolate he said to himself more desolate than stonehenge or the pyramids we don't believe in egyptian mythology but the egyptians did and i suppose even the druids believed in druidism but the eighteenth century gentlemen who built these temples didn't believe in venus or mercury any more than we do that's why the reflection of those pale pillars in the lake is truly only the shadow of a shade they were men of the age of reason they who filled their gardens with these stone nymphs had less hope than any man in all history of really meeting a nymph in the forest his monologue stopped abruptly with a sharp noise like a thundercrack that rolled in dreary echoes round the dismal mere he knew at once what it was somebody had fired off a gun but as to the meaning of it he was momentarily staggered and strange thoughts thronged into his mind the next moment he laughed for he saw lying a little way along the path below him the dead bird that the shot had brought down at the same moment however he saw something else which interested him more a ring of dense trees ran round the back of the island temple framing the facade of it in dark foliage and he could have sworn he saw a stir as of something moving among the leaves the next moment his suspicion was confirmed for a rather ragged figure came from under the shadow of the temple and began to move along the causeway that led to the bank even at that distance the figure was conspicuous by its great height and fisher could see that the man carried a gun under his arm there came back into his memory at once the name Long Adam, the poacher. With the rapid sense of strategy he sometimes showed, Fisher sprang from the bank and raced round the lake to the head of the little pier of stones. If once a man reached the mainland he could easily vanish into the woods. But when Fisher began to advance along the stones toward the island, the man was cornered in a blind alley and could only back toward the temple. Putting his broad shoulders against it, he stood as if at bay. He was a comparatively young man with fine lines in his lean face, and a figure and a mop of ragged red hair. The look in his eyes might well have been disquieting to anyone left alone with him on an island in the middle of a lake. "'Good morning,' said Horne Fisher pleasantly. 
I thought at first you were a murderer, but it seems unlikely, somehow, that the partridge rushed between us and died for love of me, like the heroines in the romances. So I suppose you're a poacher. I suppose you would call me a poacher, answered the man, and his voice was something of a surprise coming from such a scarecrow. It had that hard fastidiousness to be found in those who have made a fight for their own refinement among rough surroundings. I consider I have a perfect right to shoot game in this place, but I am well aware that people of your sort take me for a thief, and I suppose you will try to land me in jail. There are preliminary difficulties, replied Fisher. To begin with, the mistake is flattering, but I am not a gamekeeper. Still less am I three gamekeepers who would be, I imagine, about your fighting weight. But I confess I have another reason for not wanting to jail you. And what is that? asked the other. Only that I quite agree with you, answered Fisher. I don't exactly say you have a right to poach, but I never could see that it was as wrong as being a thief. It seems to me against the whole normal notion of property, that a man should own something because it flies across his garden. He might as well own the wind, or think he could write his name on a morning cloud. Besides, if we want poor people to respect property, we must give them some property to respect. You ought to have land of your own, and I am going to give you some if I can. Going to give me some land, repeated Long Adam. I apologise for addressing you as if you are a public meeting, said Fisher, but I am an entirely new kind of public man, who says the same thing in public and in private. I have said this to a hundred huge meetings throughout the country, and I say it to you on this queer little island in this dismal pond. I would cut up a big estate like this into small estates for everybody, even for poachers. I would do in England as they did in Ireland. Buy the big men out, if possible, get them out anyhow. A man like you ought to have a little place of his own. I don't say you could keep pheasants, but you might keep chickens. The man stiffened suddenly, and he seemed at once to blanch and flame at the promise, as if it were a threat. Chickens, he repeated, with a passion of contempt. Why do you object? asked the placid candidate. Because keeping hens is rather a mild amusement for a poacher. What about poaching eggs? Because I am not a poacher, cried Adam, in a rending voice that rang round the hollow shrines and urns like the echoes of his gun. Because the partridge lying dead over there is my partridge, because the land you are standing on is my land. Because my own land was only taken from me by a crime, and a worse crime than poaching. This has been a singular state for hundreds and hundreds of years, and if you or any meddlesome mountebank comes here and talks of cutting it up like a cake, if ever I hear a word more of you and your levelling lies, you seem to be a rather turbulent public, observed Horn Fisher. But do go on. What will happen if I try to divide this estate decently among decent people? The poacher had recovered a grim composure as he replied, There will be no partridge to rush in between. With that he turned his back, evidently resolved to say no more, and walked past the temple to the extreme end of the islet, where he stood staring into the water. Fisher followed him, but when his repeated questions evoked no answer, turned back toward the shore. In doing so, he took a second and closer look at the artificial temple, and noted some curious things about it. Most of these theatrical things were as thin as theatrical scenery, and he expected the classic shrine to be a shallow thing, a mere shell or mask. But there was some substantial bulk of it behind, buried in the trees, which had a grey labyrinthian look, like serpents of stone and lifted a load of leafy towers to the sky, but what arrested Fisher's eye was that in this bulk of grey and white stone behind there was a single door with great rusty bolts outside. The bolts, however, were not shot across so as to secure it. Then he walked round the small building and found no other opening except one small grating like a ventilator, high up in the wall. He retraced his steps thoughtfully along the causeway to the banks of the lake and sat down on the stone steps between the two sculptured funeral urns. Then he lit a cigarette, and smoked it in ruminant manner. Eventually he took out a notebook and wrote down various phrases, numbering and renumbering them till they stood in the following order. 1. Squire Hawker disliked his first wife. 2. He married his second wife for her money. 3. Long Adam says the estate is really his. 4. 
Long Adam hangs round the island temple, which looks like a prison. Five, Squire Hawker was not poor when he gave up the estate. Six, Verno was poor when he got the estate. He gazed at these notes with a gravity which gradually turned to a hard smile, threw away his cigarette and resumed his search for a shortcut to the great house. He soon picked up the path, which, winding among clipped hedges and flower beds, brought him in front of its long palladian façade. It had the usual appearance of being not a private house, but a sort of public building sent into exile in the provinces. He first found himself in the presence of the butler, who really looked much older than the building, for the architecture was dated as Georgian, but the man's face, under a high, unnatural brown wig, was wrinkled with what might have been centuries. Only his prominent eyes were alive and alert, as if with protest. Fisher glanced at him, and then stopped and said, "'Excuse me, weren't you with the late squire, Mr. Hawker?' "'Yes, sir,' said the man gravely. "'Usher is my name. What can I do for you?' "'Only take me into Sir Francis Verner,' replied the visitor. Sir Francis Verner was sitting in an easy chair beside a small table in a large room hung with tapestries. On the table were a small flask and glass with the green glimmer of a liqueur and a cup of black coffee. He was clad in a quiet grey suit with a moderately harmonious purple tie. But Fisher saw something about the turn of his fair moustache and the lie of his flat hair. It suddenly revealed that his name was Franz Werner. You are Mr. Horne Fisher, he said. Won't you sit down? No, thank you, replied Fisher. I fear this is not a friendly occasion, and I shall remain standing. Possibly you know that I am already standing, standing for Parliament, in fact. I am aware we are political opponents, replied Werner, raising his eyebrows, but I think it would be better if we fought in a sporting spirit, in a spirit of English fair play. Much better, assented Fisher. It would be much better if you were English, and very much better if you had ever played fair. But what I've come to say can be said very shortly. I don't quite know how we stand with the law about that old Hawker story, but my chief object is to prevent England being entirely ruled by people like you. So whatever the law would say, I will say no more if you will retire from the election at once. You are evidently a lunatic, said Werner. My psychology may be a little abnormal, replied Horn Fisher in a rather hazy manner. I am subject to dreams, especially daydreams. Sometimes what is happening to me grows vivid in a curious double way, as if it had happened before. Have you ever had that mystical feeling that things have happened before? I hope you're a harmless lunatic, said Werner. But Fisher was still staring in an absent fashion at the golden, gigantic figures and traceries of brown and red in the tapestries on the walls. Then he looked again at Werner and resumed. I have a feeling that this interview has happened before, here in this tapestried room, and we are two ghosts revisiting a haunted chamber. But it was Squire Hawker who sat where you sit, and it was you who stood where I stand. He paused a moment and then added with simplicity, I suppose I am a blackmailer too. If you are, said Sir Francis, I promise you, you shall go to jail but his face had a shade on it that looked like the reflection of the green wine gleaming on the table. Horn Fisher regarded him steadily, and answered, quietly enough, Blackmailers do not always go to jail, sometimes they go to Parliament. But though Parliament is rotten enough already, you shall not go there if I can help it. I am not so criminal as you were in bargaining with crime. You made a squire give up his country seat. I only ask you to give up your parliamentary seat. Sir Francis Verner sprang to his feet and looked about for one of the bell ropes of the old-fashioned curtained room. Where is Usher? he cried with a livid face. And who is Usher? said Fisher softly. I wonder how much Usher knows of the truth. Verner's hand fell from the bell rope, and, after standing for a moment with rolling eyes, he strode abruptly from the room. Fisher went out by the other door, by which he had entered, and, seeing no sign of Usher, let himself out and betook himself again toward the town. That night 
he put an electric torch in his pocket and set out alone in the darkness to add the last links to his argument. There was much that he did not know yet, but he thought he knew where he could find the knowledge. The night closed dark and stormy, and the black gap in the wall looked blacker than ever. The woods seemed to have grown thicker and darker in a day. If the deserted lake with its black woods and grey urns and images looked desolate even by daylight, under the night and the growing storm it seemed still more like the pool of Asheron in the land of lost souls. As he stepped carefully along the jetty stones, he seemed to be travelling farther and farther into the abyss of night, and to have left behind him the last points from which it would be possible to signal to the land of the living. The lake seemed to have grown larger than a sea, but a sea of black and slimy waters that had slept with abominable serenity, as if they had washed out the world. There was so much of this nightmare sense of extension and expansion that he was strangely surprised to come to his desert island so soon. But he knew it for a place of inhuman silence and solitude, and he felt as if he had been walking for years. Nerving himself to a more normal mood, he paused under one of the dark dragon trees that branched out above him, and, taking out his torch, turned in the direction of the door at the back of the temple. It was unbolted as before, and the thought stirred faintly in him that it was slightly open, though only by a crack. The more he thought of it, however, the more certain he grew that this was but one of the common illusions of light coming from a different angle. He studied in a more scientific spirit the details of the door with its rusty bolts and hinges, when he became conscious of something very near him, indeed nearly above his head. Something was dangling from the tree that was not a broken branch. For some seconds he stood as still as a stone and as cold. What he saw above him were the legs of a man hanging, presumably a dead man hanged. But the next moment he knew better the man was literally alive and kicking, and an instant after he had dropped to the ground and turned on the intruder. Simultaneously three or four other trees seemed to come to life in the same fashion. Five or six other figures had fallen on their feet from these unnatural nests. It was as if the place were an island of monkeys. But a moment after they had made a stampede toward him. And when they laid their hands on him he knew that they were men. With the electric torch in his hand he struck the foremost of them so furiously in the face that the man stumbled and rolled over on the slimy grass. But the torch was broken and extinguished, leaving everything in a denser obscurity. He flung another man against the temple wall so that he slid to the ground, but a third and fourth carried Fisher off his feet and began to bear him struggling toward the doorway. Even in the bewilderment of the battle he was conscious that the door was standing open. Someone was summoning the roughs from inside. The moment they were within they hurled him upon a sort of bench or bed with violence but no damage, for the settee, or whatever it was, seemed to be comfortably cushioned for his reception. Their violence had in it a great element of haste, and before he could rise they had all rushed from the door to escape. Whatever bandits they were that infested this desert island, they were obviously uneasy about their job and very anxious to be quit of it. He had the flying fancy that regular criminals would hardly be in such a panic. The next moment the great door crashed to, and he could hear the bolts shriek as they shot into place, and the feet of the retreating men scampering and stumbling along the causeway. But, rapidly as it had happened, it did not happen before Fisher had done something that he wanted to do. Unable to rise from his sprawling attitude in that flash of time, he had shot out one of his long legs and hooked it round the ankle of the last man disappearing through the door. The man swayed and toppled over inside the prison chamber, and the door closed between him and his fleeing companions. Clearly they were in too much haste to realise that they had left one of their company behind. The man sprang to his feet again and hammered and kicked furiously at the door. Fisher's sense of humour began to recover from the struggle, and he sat up on his sofa with something of his native nonchalance. But as he listened to the captive captor beating on the door of the prison, a new and curious reflection came to him. The natural course for a man thus wishing to attract his friend's attention would be to call out, to shout as well as kick. 
This man was making as much noise as he could with his feet and hands, but not a sound came from his throat. Why couldn't he speak? At first he thought the man might be gagged, which was manifestly absurd. Then his fancy fell back on the ugly idea that the man was dumb. He hardly knew why it was so ugly an idea, but it affected his imagination in a dark and disproportionate fashion. There seemed to be something creepy about the idea of being left in a dark room with a deaf mute. It was almost as if such a defect were a deformity. It was almost as if it went with other and worse deformities. It was as if the shape he could not trace in the darkness were some shape that could not see the sun. Then he had a flash of sanity and also of insight. The explanation was very simple, but rather interesting. Obviously the man did not use his voice, because he did not wish his voice to be recognised. He hoped to escape from that dark place before Fisher found out who he was. And who was he? One thing at least was clear. He was one or other of the four or five men with whom Fisher had already talked in these parts, and in the development of that strange story. Now I wonder who you are, he said aloud with all his old lazy urbanity. I suppose it's no use trying to throttle you in order to find out. It would be displeasing to pass the night with a corpse. Besides, I might be the corpse. I've got no matches, and I've smashed my torch, so I can only speculate. Who could you be now? Let us think. The man thus genially addressed had desisted from drumming on the door, and retreated sullenly into a corner as Fisher continued to address him in a flowing monologue. Probably you're the poacher who says he isn't a poacher. He says he's a landed proprietor, but he will permit me to inform him that, whatever he is, he's a fool. What hope can there ever be of a free peasantry in England, if the peasants themselves are such snobs as to want to be gentlemen? How can we make a democracy with no democrats? As it is, you want to be a landlord, and so you consent to be a criminal. And in that, you know, you are rather like somebody else. And now I think of it, perhaps you are somebody else. There was a silence, broken by breathing from the corner, and the murmur of the rising storm, that came in through the small grating above the man's head. Horn Fisher continued. Are you only a servant, perhaps, that rather sinister old servant who was butler to Hawker and Werner? If so, you are certainly the only link between the two periods. But if so, why do you degrade yourself to serve this dirty foreigner? when you at least saw the last of a genuine national gentry. People like you are generally at least patriotic. Doesn't England mean anything to you, Mr. Usher? All of which eloquence is possibly wasted, as perhaps you are not Mr. Usher. More likely, you are Werner himself. And it's no good wasting eloquence to make you ashamed of yourself, nor is it any good to curse you for corrupting England, nor are you the right person to curse. It is the English who deserve to be cursed, and are cursed, because they allowed such vermin to crawl into the high places of their heroes and their kings. I won't dwell on the idea that you're Werner, or the throttling might begin after all. Is there anyone else you could be? Surely you're not some servant of the other rival organization. I can't believe you're Grice the agent, and yet Grice had a spark of the fanatic in his eye too. And men will do extraordinary things in these paltry feuds of politics. Or, if not the servant, is it the... No, I can't believe it. Not the red blood of manhood and liberty. Not the democratic ideal. He sprang up in excitement, and at the same moment a growl of thunder came through the grating beyond. A storm had broken, and with it a new light broke on his mind. There was something else that might happen in a moment. Do you know what that means? he cried. It means that God himself may hold a candle to show me your infernal face. The next moment came a crash of thunder, but before the thunder a white light had filled the whole room for a single split second. Fisher had seen two things in front of him. One was the black and white pattern of the iron grating against the sky. The other was the face in the corner. It was the face of his brother. Nothing came from Horn Fisher's lips except a Christian name, which was followed by a silence more dreadful than the dark. At last the other figure stirred and sprang up, and the voice of Harry Fisher was heard for the first time in that horrible room. You've seen me, 
I suppose, he said, and we may as well have a light now. You could have turned it on at any time if you had found the switch. He pressed a button in the wall, and all the details of that room sprang into something stronger than daylight. Indeed, the details were so unexpected that for a moment they turned the captive's rocking mind from the last personal revelation. The room, so far from being a dungeon cell, was more like a drawing-room, even a lady's drawing-room, except for some boxes of cigars and bottles of wine that were stacked with books and magazines on a side table. A second glance showed him that the more masculine fittings were quite recent, and that the more feminine background was quite old. His eye caught a strip of faded tapestry, which startled him into speech, to the momentary oblivion of bigger matters. This place was furnished from the great house, he said. Yes, replied the other, and I think you know why. I think I do, said Horn Fisher, and before I go on to more extraordinary things, I will say what I think. Squire Hawker played both the bigamist and the bandit. His first wife was not dead when he married the Jewess. She was imprisoned on this island. She bore him a child here, who now haunts his birthplace under the name of Long Adam. A bankruptcy company promoter named Werner discovered the secret and blackmailed the squire into surrendering the estate. That's all quite clear and very easy. And now let me go on to something more difficult. And that is for you to explain what the devil you are doing kidnapping your born brother. After a pause, Henry Fisher answered, I suppose you didn't expect to see me, he said, but after all, what could you expect? I'm afraid I don't follow, said Horn Fisher. I mean, what else could you expect after making such a muck of it, said his brother sulkily. We all thought you were so clever. How could we know you were going to be, well, really such a rotten failure? This is rather curious, said the candidate, frowning. Without vanity, I was not under the impression that my candidature was a failure. All the big meetings were successful, and crowds of people have promised me votes. I should jolly well think they had, said Henry grimly. You've made a landslide with your confounded acres and a cow, and Werner can hardly get a vote anywhere. Oh, it's too rotten for anything. What on earth do you mean? Why, you lunatic, cried Henry, in tones of ringing sincerity. You don't suppose you were meant to win the seat, do you? Oh, it's too childish. I tell you, Werner's got to get in. Of course he's got to get in. He's to have the exchequer next session, and there's the Egyptian loan, and Lord knows what else. We only wanted you to split the reform vote, because accidents might happen after Hughes had made a score at Barkington. I see, said Fisher, and you, I think, are a pillar and ornament of the reform party? As you say, I am not clever. The appeal to party loyalty fell on deaf ears, for the pillar of reform was brooding on other things. At last he said in a more troubled voice, I didn't want you to catch me. I knew it would be a shock, but I tell you what. You never would have caught me if I hadn't come here myself, to see they didn't ill-treat you, and to make sure everything was as comfortable as it could be. There was even a sort of break in his voice as he added, I got those cigars because I knew you liked them. Emotions are queer things, and the idiocy of this concession suddenly softened Horn Fisher, like an unfathomable pathos. Never mind, old chap, he said, we'll say no more about it. I'll admit that you're really as kind-hearted and affectionate a scoundrel and hypocrite as ever sold himself to ruin his country. There, I can't say handsomer than that. Thank you for the cigars, old man. I'll have one if you don't mind. By the time that Horn Fisher had ended his telling of this story to Harold March, they had come out into one of the public parks and taken a seat on a rise of ground overlooking wide green spaces under a blue and empty sky and there was something incongruous in the words with which the narration ended. I've been in that room ever since, said Horn Fisher. I'm in it now. I won the election, but I never went to the house. My life has been a life in that little room on that lonely island. Plenty of books and cigars and luxuries, plenty of knowledge and interest and information, but never a voice out of that tomb to reach the world outside. I shall probably die there and he smiled as he looked across the vast green park to the grey horizon. End of chapter
Chapter Eight: The Vengeance of the Statue. It was on the sunny veranda of a seaside hotel, overlooking a pattern of flower beds and a strip of blue sea, that Horne Fisher and Harold March had their final explanation, which might be called an explosion. Harold March had come to the little table and sat down at it with a subdued excitement smouldering in his somewhat cloudy and dreamy blue eyes. In the newspapers which he tossed from him onto the table, there was enough to explain some, if not all, of his emotion. Public affairs in every department had reached a crisis. The government, which had stood so long that men were used to it, as they are used to a hereditary despotism, had begun to be accused of blunders, and even of financial abuses. Some said that the experiment of attempting to establish a peasantry in the west of England, on the lines of an early fancy of horned fishers, had resulted in nothing but dangerous quarrels with more industrial neighbours. There had been particular complaints of the ill-treatment of harmless foreigners, chiefly Asiatics, who happened to be employed in the new scientific works constructed on the coast. Indeed, the new power which had arisen in Siberia, backed by Japan and other powerful allies, was inclined to take the matter up in the interests of its exiled subjects, and there had been wild talk about ambassadors and ultimatums. But something much more serious in its personal interest for March himself seemed to fill his meeting with his friend with a mixture of embarrassment and indignation. Perhaps it increased his annoyance that there was a certain unusual liveliness about the usually languid figure of Fisher. The ordinary image of him in March's mind was that of a pallid and bald-browed gentleman, who seemed to be prematurely old as well as prematurely bald. He was remembered as a man who expressed the opinions of a pessimist in the language of a lounger. Even now March could not be certain whether the change was merely a sort of masquerade of sunshine, or that effect of clear colours and clean-cut outlines that is always visible on the parade of a marine resort, relieved against the blue dado of the sea. But Fisher had a flower in his buttonhole, and his friend could have sworn he carried his cane with something almost like the swagger of a fighter. With such clouds gathering over England, the pessimist seemed to be the only man who carried his own sunshine. "'Look here,' said Harold March abruptly. "'You've been no end of a friend to me, and I never was so proud of a friendship before. But there's something I must get off my chest. The more I found out, the less I understood how you could stand it, and I tell you I'm going to stand it no longer.' Horne Fisher gazed across at him gravely and attentively but rather as if he were a long way off. "'You know, I always liked you,' said Fisher quietly, "'but I also respect you, which is not always the same thing. You may possibly guess that I like a good many people I don't respect. Perhaps it is my tragedy, perhaps it is my fault. But you are very different, and I promise you this, that I will never try to keep you as somebody to be liked at the price of your not being respected.' I know you're magnanimous, said March, after a silence, and yet you tolerate and perpetuate everything that is mean. Then, after another silence, he added, Do you remember when we first met, when you were fishing in that brook in the affair of the target? And do you remember you said that, after all, it might do no harm if I could blow the whole tangle of this society to hell with dynamite? Yes, and what of that? asked Fisher. Only that I'm going to blow it to hell with dynamite, said Harold March and I think it right to give you fair warning. For a long time I didn't believe things were as bad as you said they were, but I never felt as if I could have bottled up what you knew, supposing you really knew it. Well, the long and the short of it is that I've got a conscience, and now, at last, I've also got a chance. I've been put in charge of a big independent paper with a free hand, and we're going to open a cannonade on corruption. That will be Atwood, I suppose, said Fisher, reflectively. Timber merchant, knows a lot about China. He knows a lot about England, said March doggedly, and now I know it too. We're not going to hush it up any longer. The people of this country have a right to know how they're ruled, or rather ruined. 
The Chancellor is in the pocket of the money-lenders, and has to do as he is told, otherwise he's bankrupt, and a bad sort of bankruptcy too, with nothing but cards and actresses behind it. The Prime Minister was in the petrol contract business, and deep in it too. The Foreign Minister is a wreck of drink and drugs. When you say that plainly about a man who may send thousands of Englishmen to die for nothing, you're called personal. If a poor engine driver gets drunk and sends thirty or forty people to death, nobody complains of the exposure being personal. The engine driver is not a person. I quite agree with you, said Fisher calmly. You're perfectly right. If you agree with us, why the devil don't you act with us? demanded his friend. If you think it's right, why don't you do what's right? It's awful to think of a man of your abilities simply blocking the road to reform. We have often talked about that, replied Fisher, with the same composure. The Prime Minister is my father's friend, the Foreign Minister married my sister, the Chancellor of the Exchequer is my first cousin. I mentioned the genealogy in some detail just now for a particular reason. The truth is, I have a curious kind of cheerfulness at the moment. It isn't altogether the sun and the sea, sir. I'm enjoying an emotion that is entirely new to me. A happy sensation I never remember having had before. What the devil do you mean? I'm feeling proud of my family, said Horn Fisher. Harold March stared at him with round blue eyes, and seemed too much mystified even to ask a question. Fisher leaned back in his chair in his lazy fashion, and smiled as he continued. Look here, my dear fellow, let me ask a question in turn. You imply that I have always known these things about my unfortunate kinsman. So I have. Do you suppose that Atwood hasn't always known them? Do you suppose he hasn't always known you as an honest man who would say these things when he got a chance? Why does Atwood unmuzzle you like a dog at this moment, after all these years? I know why he does. I know a good many things, far too many things. And therefore, as I have the honour to remark, I am proud of my family at last. But why? repeated March, rather feebly. I am proud of the Chancellor because he gambled, and the Foreign Minister because he drank, and the Prime Minister because he took a commission on a contract, said Fisher firmly. I am proud of them because they did these things, and can be denounced for them, and know they can be denounced for them, and are standing firm for all that. I take off my hat to them, because they are defying blackmail, and refusing to smash their country to save themselves. I salute them as if they were going to die on the battlefield. After a pause he continued, and it will be a battlefield too, and not a metaphorical one. We have yielded to foreign financiers so long that now it is war or ruin. Even the people, even the country people, are beginning to suspect that they are being ruined. That is the meaning of the regrettable incidents in the newspapers. The meaning of the outrages on Orientals? asked March. The meaning of the outrages on Orientals, replied Fisher, is that the financiers have introduced Chinese labour into this country with the deliberate intention of reducing workmen and peasants to starvation. Our unhappy politicians have made concession after concession, and now they are asking concessions which amount to our ordering a massacre of our own poor. If we do not fight now, we shall never fight again. They will have put England in an economic position of starving in a week. But we are going to fight now. I shouldn't wonder if there were an ultimatum in a week and an invasion in a fortnight. All the past corruption and cowardice is hampering us, of course. The West Country is pretty stormy and doubtful, even in a military sense, and the Irish regiments there that are supposed to support us by the new treaty are pretty well in mutiny, for, of course, this infernal coolie capitalism is being pushed in Ireland, too. But it's to stop now, and if the government message of reassurance gets through to them in time, they may turn up after all by the time the enemy lands. For my poor old gang is going to stand to its guns at last. Of course it's only natural that when they have been whitewashed for half a century as paragons, their sins should come back on them at the very moment when they are behaving like men for the first time in their lives. 
Well, I tell you, March, I know them inside out, and I know they are behaving like heroes. Every man of them ought to have a statue, and on the pedestal words like those of the noblest ruffian of the revolution. Que mon nom soit flétri, que la France soit libre. Good God, cried March, shall we never get to the bottom of your mines and countermines? After a silence, Fisher answered in a lower voice, looking his friend in the eyes. Did you think there was nothing but evil at the bottom of them? he asked gently. Did you think I had found nothing but filth in the deep seas into which fate has thrown me? Believe me, you never know the best about men till you know the worst about them. It does not dispose of their strange human souls to know that they were exhibited to the world as impossibly impeccable waxworks, who never looked after a woman or knew the meaning of a bribe. Even in a palace life can be lived well, and even in Parliament life can be lived with occasional efforts to live it well. I tell you it is as true of these rich fools and rascals as it is true of every poor footpad and pickpocket, that only God knows how good they have tried to be. God alone knows what the conscience can survive, or how a man who has lost his honour will still try to save his soul. There was another silence and March sat staring at the table and Fisher at the sea. Then Fisher suddenly sprang to his feet and caught up his hat and stick with all his new alertness and even pugnacity. Look here, old fellow, he cried, let us make a bargain. Before you open up your campaign for Atwood, come down and stay with us for one week to hear what we are really doing. I mean with the faithful few formerly known as the old gang, occasionally to be described as the low lot. There are really only five of us that are quite fixed and organising the national defence. And we're living like a garrison in a sort of broken-down hotel in Kent. Come and see what we're really doing and what there is to be done, and do us justice. And after that, with unalterable love and affection for you, publish and be damned. Thus it came about that in the last week before the war, when events moved most rapidly, Harold March found himself one of a sort of small house party of the people he was proposing to denounce. They were living simply enough, for people with their tastes, in an old brown brick inn faced with ivy and surrounded by rather dismal gardens. At the back of the building the garden ran up very steeply to a road along the ridge above, and a zigzag path scaled the slopes in sharp angles turning to and fro amid evergreens so sombre that they might rather be called ever black. Here and there up the slope were statues having all the cold monstrosity of such minor ornaments of the eighteenth century. And a whole row of them ran as on a terrace along the last bank at the bottom, opposite the back door. This detail fixed itself first in March's mind, merely because it figured in the first conversation he had with one of the cabinet ministers. The cabinet ministers were rather older than he had expected to find them. The prime minister no longer looked like a boy, though he still looked a little like a baby. But it was one of those old and venerable babies, and the baby had soft grey hair. Everything about him was soft to his speech and his way of walking, but over and above that his chief function seemed to be sleep. People left alone with him got so used to his eyes being closed that they were almost startled when they realised in the stillness that the eyes were wide open and even watching. One thing, at least, would always make the old gentleman open his eyes. The one thing he really cared for in this world was his hobby of armoured weapons, especially eastern weapons, and he would talk for hours about Damascus blades and Arab swordsmanship. Lord James Herries, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, was a short, dark, sturdy man with a very sallow face and a very sullen manner, which contrasted with the gorgeous flower in his buttonhole and his festive trick of being always slightly overdressed. It was something of a euphemism to call him a well-known man about town. There was perhaps more mystery in the question of how a man who lived for pleasure seemed to get so little pleasure out of it. Sir David Archer, the Foreign Secretary, was the only one of them who was a self-made man, and the only one of them who looked like an aristocrat. He was tall and thin and very handsome, with a grizzled beard. His grey hair was very curly, 
and even rose in front into rebellious ringlets that seemed to the fanciful to tremble like the antennae of some giant insect, or to stir sympathetically with the restless tufted eyebrows over his rather haggard eyes. For the Foreign Secretary made no secret of his somewhat nervous condition, whatever might be the cause of it. Do you know that mood when one could scream because a mat is crooked, he said to March, as they walked up and down in the back garden below the line of dingy statues? Women get into it when they've worked too hard, and I've been working pretty hard lately, of course. Drives me mad when Harry's will wear his hat a little crooked. Habit of looking like a gay dog. Sometime I swear I'll knock it off. That statue of Britannia over there isn't quite straight. It sticks forward a bit, as if the lady were going to topple over. The damn thing is that it doesn't topple over and be done with it. See, it's clamped with an iron prop. Don't be surprised if I get up in the middle of the night to hike it down. They paced the path for a few moments in silence, and then he continued, It's odd those little things seem specially big when there are bigger things to worry about. We had better go in and do some work. Horn Fisher evidently allowed for all the neurotic possibilities of Archer and the dissipated habits of Herries, and whatever his faith in their present firmness did not unduly tax their time and attention, even in the case of the Prime Minister. He had got the consent of the latter, finally, to the committing of the important documents, with the orders to the Western armies, to the care of a less conspicuous and more solid person, an uncle of his named Horn Hewitt, a rather colourless country squire who had been a good soldier, and was the military adviser of the committee. He was charged with expediting the government pledge, along with the concerted military plans, to the half-mutinous command in the West and the still more urgent task of seeing that it did not fall into the hands of the enemy, who might appear at any moment from the east. Over and above this military official, the only other person present was a police official, a certain Dr. Prince, originally a police surgeon and now a distinguished detective, sent to be a bodyguard to the group. He was a square-faced man with big spectacles and a grimace that expressed the intention of keeping his mouth shut. Nobody else shared their captivity except the hotel proprietor, a crusty Kentish man with a crab-apple face, one or two of his servants, and another servant privately attached to Lord James Herries. He was a young Scotchman named Campbell, who looked much more distinguished than his bilious-looking master having chestnut hair and a long saturnine face, with large but fine features. He was probably the only really efficient person in the house. After about four days of the informal council, March had come to feel a sort of grotesque sublimity about these dubious figures, defiant in the twilight of danger, as if they were hunchbacks and cripples left alone to defend a town. All were working hard, and he himself looked up from writing a page of memoranda in a private room to see Horn Fisher standing in the doorway, accoutred as if for travel. He fancied that Fisher looked a little pale, and after a moment that gentleman shut the door behind him and said quietly, Well, the worst has happened, or nearly the worst. The enemy has landed, cried March, and sprang erect out of his chair. Oh, I knew the enemy would land, said Fisher with composure. Yes, he's landed, but that's not the worst that could happen. The worst is that there's a leak of some sort, even from this fortress of ours. It's been a bit of a shock to me, I can tell you, though I suppose it's illogical. After all, I was full of admiration at finding three honest men in politics. I ought not to be full of astonishment if I find only two. He ruminated a moment, and then said in such a fashion that March could hardly tell if he were changing the subject or no. It's hard at first to believe that a fellow like Herries, who had pickled himself in vice like vinegar, can have any scruple left. But about that I've noticed a curious thing. Patriotism is not the first virtue. Patriotism rots into Prussianism when you pretend it is the first virtue. But patriotism is sometimes the last virtue. A man will swindle or seduce who will not sell his country. But who knows? But what is to be done? cried March indignantly. 
My uncle has the papers safe enough, replied Fisher, and is sending them west tonight. But somebody is trying to get at them from outside, I fear with the assistance of somebody inside. All I can do at present is to try to head off the man outside, and I must get away now and do it. I shall be back in about twenty-four hours. While I'm away, I want you to keep an eye on these people and find out what you can. Au revoir. He vanished down the stairs, and from the window March could see him mount a motorcycle and trail away toward the neighbouring town. On the following morning March was sitting in the window seat of the old inn parlour, which was oak panelled and ordinarily rather dark, but on that occasion it was full of the white light of a curiously clear morning. The moon had shone brilliantly for the last two or three nights. He was himself somewhat in shadow in the corner of the window seat, and Lord James Herries, coming in hastily from the garden behind, did not see him. Lord James clutched the back of a chair as if to steady himself, and, sitting down abruptly at the table littered with the last meal, poured himself out a tumbler of brandy and drank it. He sat with his back to March, but his yellow face appeared in a round mirror beyond, and the tinge of it was like that of some horrible malady. As March moved, he started violently and faced round. My God, he cried, have you seen what's outside? Outside, repeated the other, glancing over his shoulder at the garden. Oh, go and look for yourself, cried Herries in a sort of fury. Hewitt's murdered and his papers stolen, that's all. He turned his back again and sat down with a thud. His square shoulders were shaking. Harold March darted out of the doorway into the back garden with its steep slope of statues. The first thing he saw was Dr. Prince, the detective, peering through his spectacles at something on the ground. The second was the thing he was peering at. Even after the sensational news he had heard inside, the sight was something of a sensation. The monstrous stone image of Britannia was lying prone and face downward on the garden path, and there stuck out at random from underneath it, like the legs of a smashed fly, an arm clad in a white shirt-sleeve, and a leg clad in a khaki trouser, and hair of the unmistakable sandy grey that belonged to Hornfisher's unfortunate uncle. There were pools of blood, and the limbs were quite stiff in death. Couldn't this have been an accident, said March, finding words at last? Look for yourself, I say, repeated the harsh voice of Herries, who had followed him with restless movements out of the door. The papers are gone, I tell you. The fellow tore the coat off the corpse and cut the papers out of the inner pocket. There's the coat over there on the bank, with a great slash in it. But wait a minute, said the detective, Prince, quietly. In that case there seems to be something of a mystery. A murderer might somehow have managed to throw the statue down on him, as he seems to have done. But I bet he couldn't easily have lifted it up again. I've tried, and I'm sure it would want three men at least. Yet we must suppose, on that theory, that the murderer first knocked him down as he walked past, using the statue as a stone club, then lifted it up again, took him out and deprived him of his coat, then put him back again in the posture of death, and neatly replaced the statue. I tell you it's physically impossible. And how else could he have unclothed a man covered with that stone monument? It's worse than the conjurer's trick when a man shuffles a coat off with his wrists tied. Could he have thrown down the statue after he'd stripped the corpse? asked March. And why? asked Prince sharply. If he'd killed this man and got his papers, he'd be away like the wind. He wouldn't potter about in a garden excavating pedestals of statues. Besides, hello, who's that up there? High on the ridge above them, drawn in dark thin lines against the sky, was a figure looking so long and lean as to be almost spidery. The dark silhouette of the head showed two small tufts like horns, and they could almost have sworn that the horns moved. Archer! shouted Herries with sudden passion, and called to him with curses to come down. The figure drew back at the first cry with an agitated movement so abrupt as almost to be called an antic. The next moment the man seemed to reconsider and collect himself, and began to come down the zigzag garden path 
but with obvious reluctance, his feet falling in slower and slower rhythm. Through March's mind were throbbing the phrases that this man himself had used, about going mad in the middle of the night and wrecking the stone figure. Just so, he could fancy the maniac who had done such a thing might climb the crest of the hill in that feverish dancing fashion, and look down on the wreck he had made. But the wreck he had made here was not only a wreck of stone. When the man emerged at last onto the garden path, with the full light on his face and figure, he was walking slowly indeed, but easily, and with no appearance of fear. This is a terrible thing, he said. I saw it from above. I was taking a stroll along the ridge. Do you mean that you saw the murder? demanded March, or the accident? I mean, did you see the statue fall? No, said Archer. I mean, I saw the statue fallen. Prince seemed to be paying but little attention. His eye was riveted on an object lying on the path a yard or two from the corpse. It seemed to be a rusty iron bar, bent crooked at one end. One thing I don't understand, he said, is all this blood. The poor fellow's skull isn't smashed, most likely his neck is broken, but blood seems to have spouted as if all his arteries were severed. I was wondering if some other instrument, that iron thing, for instance, but I don't see that even that is sharp enough. I suppose nobody knows what it is. I know what it is, said Archer, in his deep but somewhat shaky voice. I've seen it in my nightmares. It was the iron clamp or prop on the pedestal, stuck on to keep the wretched image upright when it began to wobble, I suppose. Anyhow, it was always stuck in the stonework there, and I suppose it came out when the thing collapsed. Dr. Prince nodded, but he continued to look down at the pools of blood and the bar of iron. I'm certain there's something more underneath all this, he said at last, perhaps something more underneath the statue. I have a huge sort of hunch that there is. We're four men now, and between us we can lift that great tombstone there. They all bent their strength to the business. There was a silence save for heavy breathing, and then, after an instant of the tottering and staggering of eight legs, the great carven column of rock was rolled away, and the body lying in its shirt and trousers was fully revealed. The spectacles of Dr. Prince seemed almost to enlarge with a restrained radiance like great eyes, for other things were revealed also. One was that the unfortunate Hewitt had a deep gash across the jugular, which the triumphant doctor instantly identified as having been made with a sharp steel edge like a razor. The other was that immediately under the bank lay littered three shining scraps of steel, each nearly a foot long, one pointed and another fitted into a gorgeously jewelled hilt or handle. It was evidently a sort of long oriental knife, long enough to be called a sword, but with a curious wavy edge, and there was a touch or two of blood on the point. I should have expected more blood, hardly on the point, observed Dr. Prince thoughtfully, but this is certainly the instrument. The slash was certainly made with a weapon shaped like this, and probably the slashing of the pocket as well. I suppose the brute threw in the statue by way of giving him a public funeral. March did not answer. He was mesmerized by the strange stones that glittered on the strange sword hilt, and their possible significance was broadening upon him like a dreadful dawn. It was a curious Asiatic weapon. He knew what name was connected in his memory with curious Asiatic weapons. Lord James spoke his secret thought for him, and yet it startled him like an irrelevance. Where is the Prime Minister? Harris had cried suddenly, and somehow like the bark of a dog at some discovery. Dr. Prince turned on him his goggles and his grim face, and it was grimmer than ever. I cannot find him anywhere, he said. I looked for him at once, as soon as I found the papers were gone. That servant of yours, Campbell, made a most efficient search, but there are no traces. There was a long silence, at the end of which Herries uttered another cry, but upon an entirely new note. Well, you needn't look for him any longer, he said, for here he comes, along with your friend Fisher. They look as if they'd been for a little walking tour. The two figures approaching up the path were, indeed, 
those of Fisher splashed with the mire of travel and carrying a scratch like that of a bramble across one side of his bald forehead, and of the great grey-haired statesman, who looked like a baby and was interested in eastern swords and swordsmanship. But beyond this bodily recognition, March could make neither head nor tail of their presence or demeanour, which seemed to give a final touch of nonsense to the whole nightmare. The more closely he watched them, as they stood listening to the revelations of the detective, the more puzzled he was by their attitude. Fisher seemed grieved by the death of his uncle, but hardly shocked at it. The other man seemed almost openly thinking about something else, and neither had anything to suggest about a further pursuit of the fugitive spy and murderer, in spite of the prodigious importance of the documents he had stolen. When the detective had gone off to busy himself with that department of the business, to telephone and write his report, when Harris had gone back, probably to the brandy bottle, and the Prime Minister had blandly sauntered away toward a comfortable armchair in another part of the garden, Horne Fisher spoke directly to Harold March. My friend, he said, I want you to come with me at once. There is no one else I can trust so much as that. The journey will take us most of the day, and the chief business cannot be done till nightfall. So we can talk things over thoroughly on the way. But I want you to be with me, for I rather think it is my hour. March and Fisher both had motor bicycles and the first half of their day's journey consisted in coasting eastward amid the unconversational noise of those uncomfortable machines. But when they came out beyond Canterbury, into the flats of eastern Kent, Fisher stopped at a pleasant little public house beside a sleepy stream, and they sat down to eat and to drink and to speak almost for the first time. It was a brilliant afternoon, birds were singing in the wood behind, and the sun shone full on their ale bench and table but the face of Fisher in the strong sunlight had a gravity never seen on it before. Before we go any farther, he said, There is something you ought to know. You and I have seen some mysterious things and got to the bottom of them before now, and it's only right that you should get to the bottom of this one. But in dealing with the death of my uncle, I must begin at the other end from where our old detective yarns began. I will give you the steps of deduction presently if you want to listen to them, but I did not reach the truth of this by steps of deduction. I will first of all tell you the truth itself, because I knew the truth from the first. The other cases I approached from the outside, but in this case I was inside. I myself was the very core and centre of everything. Something in the speaker's pendant eyelids and grave grey eyes suddenly shook March to his foundations and he cried distractedly, I don't understand, as men do when they fear that they do understand. There was no sound for a space but the happy chatter of the birds, and then Horn Fisher said calmly, It was I who killed my uncle. If you particularly want more, it was I who stole the state papers from him. Fisher, cried his friend in a strangled voice. Let me tell you the whole thing before we part, continued the other, and let me put it for the sake of clearness, as we used to put our old problems. Now, there are two things that are puzzling people about that problem, aren't there? The first is how the murderer managed to slip off the dead man's coat when he was already pinned to the ground with that stone incubus. The other, which is much smaller and less puzzling, is the fact of the sword that cut his throat being slightly stained at the point instead of a good deal more stained at the edge. Well, I can dispose of the first question easily. Horne Hewitt took off his coat before he was killed. I might say he took off his coat to be killed. Do you call that an explanation? exclaimed March. The words seem more meaningless than the facts. Well, let us go on to the other facts, continued Fisher equably. The reason that particular sword is not stained at the edge with Hewitt's blood is that it was not used to kill Hewitt. But the doctor, protested March, declared distinctly that the wound was made by that particular sword. I beg your pardon, replied Fisher, he did not declare that it was made by that particular sword, he declared it was made by a sword of that particular pattern. But it was quite a queer and exceptional pattern, argued March, surely it is far too fantastic a coincidence to imagine. 
It was a fantastic coincidence, reflected Horne Fisher. It's extraordinary what coincidences do sometimes occur. By the oddest chance in the world, by one chance in a million, it so happened that another sword of exactly the same shape was in the same garden at the same time. It may be partly explained by the fact that I brought them both into the garden myself. Come, my dear fellow, surely you can see now what it means. Put those two things together. There are two duplicate swords, and he took off his coat for himself. It may assist your speculations to recall the fact that I am not exactly an assassin. A duel! exclaimed March, recovering himself. Of course I ought to have thought of that. But who was the spy who stole the papers? My uncle was the spy who stole the papers, replied Fisher, or who tried to steal the papers when I stopped him, in the only way I could. The papers that should have gone west to reassure our friends and give them the plans for repelling the invasion would in a few hours have been in the hands of the invader. What could I do? To have denounced one of our friends at this moment would have been to play into the hands of your friend Atwood, and all the party of panic and slavery. Beside, it may be that a man over forty has a subconscious desire to die as he has lived, and that I wanted, in a sense, to carry my secrets to the grave. Perhaps a hobby hardens with age, and my hobby has been silence. Perhaps I feel that I have killed my mother's brother, but I have saved my mother's name. Anyhow, I chose a time when I knew you were all asleep, and he was walking alone in the garden. I saw all the stone statues standing in the moonlight, and I myself was like one of those stone statues walking. In a voice that was not my own, I told him of his treason, and demanded the papers and when he refused I forced him to take one of the two swords. The swords were among some specimens sent down here for the Prime Minister's inspection. He's a collector, you know. They were the only equal weapons I could find. To cut an ugly tale short, we fought there on the patch in front of the Britannia statue. He was a man of great strength, but I had somewhat the advantage in skill. His sword grazed my forehead, almost at the moment when mine sank into the joint in his neck. He fell against the statue like Caesar against Pompey's, hanging on to the iron rail. His sword was already broken. When I saw the blood from that deadly wound, everything else went from me. I dropped my sword and ran as if to lift him up. As I bent toward him, something happened too quick for me to follow. I do not know whether the iron bar was rotted with rust and came away in his hand, or whether he rent it out of the rock with his ape-like strength. But the thing was in his hand, and with his dying energies he swung it over my head as I knelt there unarmed beside him. I looked up wildly to avoid the blow, and saw above us the great bulk of Britannia leaning outward like the figurehead of a ship. The next instant I saw it was leaning an inch or two more than usual, and all the skies with their outstanding stars seemed to be leaning with it. For the third second it was as if the skies fell, and in the fourth I was standing in the quiet garden, looking down on that flat ruin of stone and bone which you were looking at today. He had plucked out the last prop that held up the British goddess, and she had fallen and crushed the traitor in her fall. I turned and darted for the coat which I knew to contain the package, ripped it up with my sword, and raced up the garden path to where my motorbike was waiting on the road above. I had every reason for haste, but I fled without looking back at the statue and the body. And I think the thing I fled from was the sight of that appalling allegory. Then I did the rest of what I had to do. All through the night and into the daybreak and the daylight I went humming through the villages and markets of South England like a travelling bullet, till I came to the headquarters in the west where the trouble was. I was just in time. I was able to placard the place, so to speak, with the news that the government had not betrayed them, and that they would find supports if they would push eastward against the enemy. There's no time to tell you all that happened, but I tell you it was the day of my life, a triumph like a torchlight procession, with torchlights that might have been firebrands. The mutinies simmered down, the men of Somerset and the western counties came pouring into the marketplaces, the men who died with Arthur and stood firm with Alfred. The Irish regiments rallied to them, after a scene like a riot, and marched eastward out of the town singing Fenian songs. 
There was all that is not understood about the dark laughter of that people, in the delight with which, even when marching with the English to the defence of England, they shouted at the tops of their voices, High upon the gallows tree stood the noble-hearted three, with England's cruel cord about them cast. However, the chorus was God save Ireland, and we could all have sung that just then in one sense or another. But there was another side to my mission. I carried the plans of the defence, and to a great extent, luckily, the plans of the invasion also. I won't worry you with strategics, but we knew where the enemy had pushed forward the great battery that covered all his movements. And though our friends from the west could hardly arrive in time to intercept the main movement, they might get within long artillery range of the battery and shell it, if they only knew exactly where it was. They could hardly tell that, unless somebody round about here sent up some sort of signal. But somehow I rather fancy that somebody will. With that he got up from the table, and they remounted their machines, and went eastward into the advancing twilight of evening. The levels of the landscape were repeated in flat strips of floating cloud, and the last colours of day clung to the circle of the horizon. Receding farther and farther behind them was the semicircle of the last hills, and it was quite suddenly that they saw afar off the dim line of the sea. It was not a strip of bright blue as they had seen it from the sunny veranda, but of a sinister and smoky violet, a tint that seemed ominous and dark. Here Horn Fisher dismounted once more. We must walk the rest of the way, he said, and the last bit of all I must walk alone. He bent down and began to unstrap something from his bicycle. It was something that had puzzled his companion all the way, in spite of what held him to more interesting riddles. It appeared to be several lengths of pole strapped together and wrapped up in paper. Fisher took it under his arm and began to pick his way across the turf. The ground was growing more tumbled and irregular as he was walking toward a mass of thickets and small woods. Night grew darker every moment. We must not talk any more, said Fisher. I shall whisper to you when you are to halt. Don't try to follow me then, for it will only spoil the show. One man can barely crawl safely to the spot, and two would certainly be caught. I would follow you anywhere, replied March, but I would halt too, if that is better. I know you would, said his friend in a low voice. Perhaps you're the only man I ever quite trusted in this world. A few paces farther on they came to the end of a great ridge or mound looking monstrous against the dim sky, and Fisher stopped with a gesture. He caught his companion's hand and wrung it with a violent tenderness, and then darted forward into the darkness. March could faintly see his figure crawling along under the shadow of the ridge, then he lost sight of it, and then he saw it again standing on another mound two hundred yards away. Beside him stood a singular erection made apparently of two rods. He bent over it, and there was the flare of a light. All March's schoolboy memories woke in him, and he knew what it was. It was the stand of a rocket. The confused incongruous memories still possessed him up to the very last moment of a fierce but familiar sound. And an instant after, the rocket left its perch and went up into endless space like a starry arrow aimed at the stars. March thought suddenly of the signs of the last days, and he knew he was looking at the apocalyptic meteor of something like a day of judgment. Far up in the infinite heavens the rocket drooped and sprang into scarlet stars. For a moment the whole landscape out to the sea and back to the crescent of the wooded hills was like a lake of ruby light, of a red strangely rich and glorious, as if the world were steeped in wine rather than blood, or the earth were an earthly paradise over which paused forever the sanguine moment of morning. God save England, cried Fisher, with a tongue like the peal of a trumpet, and now it is for God to save. As darkness sank over land and sea, there came another sound. Far away in the passes of the hills behind them the guns spoke like the baying of great hounds. Something that was not a rocket, that came not hissing but screaming, went over Harold March's head and expanded beyond the mound into light and deafening din, staggering the brain with unbearable brutalities of noise. 
Another came, and then another, and the world was full of uproar and volcanic vapour and chaotic light. The artillery of the West Country and the Irish had located the great enemy battery and were pounding it to pieces. In the mad excitement of that moment, March peered through the storm, looking again for the long, lean figure that stood beside the stand of the rocket. Then another flash lit up the whole ridge. The figure was not there. Before the fires of the rocket had faded from the sky, long before the first gun had sounded from the distant hills, a splutter of rifle fire had flashed and flickered all around from the hidden trenches of the enemy. Something lay in the shadow at the foot of the ridge, as stiff as the stick of the fallen rocket. And the man who knew too much knew what is worth knowing. End of chapter and end of the man who knew too much.